Hi, once again, um, I'm going to be discussing obstetrics and gynecology in this lecture. Um, this is a continuation from my USMLE World notes for USMLE Step 2CK. So let's get into this. So obstetrics and gynecology on ultrasound assessment of gestational age. You have um, the ultrasound, um, what you're going to see uh, by gestational age and the accuracy in dates. So, in days. So, in a gestational sac diameter of four and a half to six weeks old, its accuracy is more or less five to seven. Um, the crown rump length at gestational age is going to be between seven to ten um, weeks, and that's going to be uh, plus or minus three in terms of accuracy and that would be actually the most accurate method of determining gestational age the estimated gestational age is going to be based on the first trimester so the ultrasound should not be changed as it's the most accurate uh, it becomes less accurate as the pregnancy progresses so in that question where it says what is the most accurate method of determining gestational age and it would be uh, ultrasound within the first trimester specifically the crown rump length between 7 to 10 weeks. And then the accuracy starts uh, falling after that. Uh, you have uh, crown rump, rump length between 11 to 14 re weeks is uh, back to plus or minus 5 in terms of accuracy. Um, bilateral diameter and head circumference and femur length is going to be... Um, also, it's going to be dropping from 7 to all the way down to 28. So, uh, and as, as, the, um, as the weeks increase, so you have from 14 weeks is more or less uh, plus or minus 7 in terms of accuracy. Um, and by accuracy, I mean days. Um, it's the, the days, how, how, how old the, uh, the fetus is. So, um, so the bi uh, biparatal diameter, head circumference, and femur length, um, if you check, you check that out at 14 weeks, all the way past more than 30 weeks, and as you, uh, as the pregnancy progresses per trimester, your accuracy in days is going to be decreased. So remember, the most accurate is going to be the crown rump rump length at um, in the first trimester and that's going to give you the most accurate method which is going to give you a time frame of around plus or minus three days all right so if the ultrasound uh, for if ultrasound for gestational age during the second and third trimester is going to show a discrepancy between estimated gestational age which is going to be calculated from the first trimester crown rump, rump length and the fetal me uh, measurements. Also, growth problems should be considered within the first trimester, such as fetal macrosomia and fetal growth restriction. Um, after 20 weeks, the fundal height can be measured in centimeters, but it varies by plus or minus three weeks in terms of accuracy and it can be confounded by a leiomyoma or obesity. So to measure the, um, the fundal height, remember it's the, the uh, measurement between the apex of the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis, as well as the um, xiphoid process. So between the umbilicus and the symph uh, pubic symphysis, that would be around 24 weeks. If it goes all the way to the cyphoid process, um, that would be 36 weeks, more or less. All right, so last, last menstrual period in patients with a reliable last menstrual period and normal menses with an estimated date of delivery and gestational age are based on the last menstrual period. That assumes a cycle of 28 days and fertilization on day 14. If the estimated gestational age varies 
more than seven days in the first trimester and 10 days in the second trimester, then you want to do an ultrasound for gestational age or an estimated gestational age uh, rather than a, a last menstrual period. So the last menstrual period is only going to be reliable to uh, estimate the delivery date and the gestational age accurately if she has a history of normal menses, if her cycles are normal, and she's just been calculating it perfectly. Otherwise, first trimester ultrasound is always the best. Okay, normal physiological changes in pregnancy. So we're going to classify this by system. So you have your renal system, uh, hematological system, cardiovascular and pulmonary. So on renal urinary system, clinical findings, uh, the changes of pregnancy are going to be that um, they'll have an increase in GFR glomerular filtration rate and a, and a renal size. They'll have a decrease in blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine. Um, and that's all due because of a high cardiac output and renal blood flow due to uh, the progesterone within the, the, the pregnancy and because of an increase in renal excretion. You'll have that filtration rate increase and the bun decreased. Um, also, you'll uh, the the pregnant, the pregnant patient will have urinary frequency in nocturia, and that's due to an increase in urine output and sodium excretion, as well as they'll have hyponatremia, and that's due to hormones that reset the threshold to increase antidiuretic hormone release from the pituitary. So because they, they have hyponatremia because of a dilutional effect, the hormones will actually... Um, mimic antidiuretic hormone or increase a little bit of the antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary and cause water retention a little bit um, and that retention will uh, dilute some of the sodium and they'll have a mild hyponatremia. All right uh, for hematology in the uh, pregnancy changes um, they'll have a dilutional anemia again because there's an increase in plasma volume also and red blood cell masses are also increased. Uh, they'll also have a, pro a prothrombotic state. Um, hormone mediated, there's going to be a hormone mediated decrease in the total number of protein S antigen activity, and there'll also be an increase in fibrinogen and coagulation factors. This is also going to increase the resistance to activated protein C. So if you have resistance to protein C, you have a decrease in protein S, that's like having a decrease in protein C and S, uh, which are part of your coagulation factors. So they'll have a prothrombotic state. Okay, cardiovascular changes during pregnancy, they'll have an increase in cardiac output and, and uh, they'll have an increase in heart rate. Uh, and that's due to the increase in blood volume. Again, there's going to be a decrease in systemic vascular resistance to comply for that increase in volume. And in the lungs, pulmonary system, changes in pregnancy, will they'll have chronic respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic compensation. So um, they'll have increase in pulmonary oxygen and a decrease in pulmonary carbon dioxide. And the reason because of this is because progesterone directly is going to stimulate the central receptor centers to increase tidal volume and increase minute ventilation. All right, so now what are some of the renal and urinary changes in normal pregnancy? So I'm going to be a little bit uh, uh, repetitious here because these are all graphs that I've written and notes that I've written on the same subject over and over again. So this is just good for repetition. So um, continuing on, uh, again, the renal and urinary changes in normal pregnancy will be physiologically, they'll have an increase in renal blood flow an increase in glomerular filtration rate, and an increase in renal basement membrane permeability. Lab findings, because of that, you'll have a decrease in serum BUN, a decrease in serum creatinine, and an increase in renal protein excretion. Um, renal function is going to gradually increase during the first trimester, and it reaches about 40 to 50% above a non-pregnant state 
by mid-pregnancy, and then it's going to remain unchanged until term. Uh, due to the increase in renal function during the pregnancy, patients on medications that are renally excreted, like let's say gabapentin, they're going to require close monitoring and dose adjustments as needed. Uh, serum creatinine of 1.2 may be the upper limit in pregnancy, and it, it could be considered renal insufficiency in pregnancy, actually. And uh, a protein excretion of more than 300 with, is a... Is going to be found. Abnormal amounts would be more than 150 in pregnancy. And urine dipstick, it's going to show trace amounts of protein with one plus protein. That's normal in pregnancy. So, right, so that, that's, that's it. So, hematology um, in pregnancy, the changes anemia in pregnancy is defined as a hemoglobin level of less than 11 in the first and in the third trimester. And then a hemoglobin less than 10.5 in the second trimester. Um, the platelet count is usually going to be normal, but they often have a mildly decreased amounts of uh, platelets. Um, so more than, thir- than 70,000 is known as gestational thrombocytopenia. All right. Pulmonary changes, progesterone is going to increase significantly during the first trimester. That's going to change homeostatic set points in the medullary respiratory center. And it's also going to directly stimulate the respiratory center in the medulla. That's going to increase ventilation. So that's why they get um, uh, decreases in CO2. The medulla becomes more sensitive to those changes in CO2. And they have an exaggerated respiratory effort. There's an increase in minute ventilation because of that progesterone. That's going to increase uh, oxygen to about 110 millimeters of mercury to meet the metabolic demands of pregnancy. And the CO2 is going to be lowered to um, anywhere from 32 all the way down to 27. Progesterone is going to be increased again, and that's uh, during the later stages of pregnancy. And that's going to increase the pH to 7.4. 7.45 with some metabolic compensation and that leads to a decrease in serum bicarbonate. All right. So pregnancy and exercise. So what are the some of the absolute contraindications to exercising in pregnancy? Well, if they have leakage of amniotic fluid would be one. If they have any kind of cervical incompetence, multiple gestation, placental abruption or placenta previa, a premature labor, um, if they have preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, as well as severe heart or lung disease. Those are all pretty uh, dangerous situations, so you obviously don't want to be thinking about exercising if you have any of those. Um, Some of the unsafe activities would be uh, contact sports. You don't want to be playing hockey or soccer or basketball while you're pregnant. There's a high uh, fall risk if you're going downhill skiing, if you're doing just gymnastics or horseback riding. That's not good. So scuba diving, that can't be good for the baby. and um, Or the mom. And uh, as well as hot yoga. Hot yoga is very unsafe in pregnancy. Uh, you want to encourage exercise that is normal, uncomplicated in pregnancy to prevent excessive weight gain and improve overall fitness and well-being. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is going to recommend that a healthy woman um, with no contraindications precipitate in low to moderate intense exercise of more than 30 minutes for five to seven days a week. A perceived exercise intensity is a better gauge of exertion than heart rate, and patients should be able to engage in normal conversation during the activity. So that would be the uh, exertional gauge that they're talking about. If you're able to hold a conversation while you're working out and pregnant, that's perfect. Uh, Pregnant women should also be advised to do physiological ligamental uh, laxities and changes in centers of balance uh, they're going to be advised because of that, because during pregnancy or um, all your, because of the increase in estrogen, 
everything's relaxed, uh, everything's laxed. So ligaments are also laxed and you can be off balance a little bit and that can increase the propensity for joint injuries and falls. Also, uh, jogging can be done, but it's, uh, remember, at a conversational pace. If you're able to jog and maintain a conversation, then that's okay. Now, swimming and walking are going to be excellent choices, but no deep sea diving, and uh, as well as low impact activities for pregnant women. Okay, next topic is hyperemesis gravidarum. So this is an important one that could be a little confusing. So risk factors here are if they've had a previous pregnancy and they've had hyperemesis gravidarum before, always risk factors um, that they've had previously are always number one in any case. Uh, multiple gestations, um, gestational trophoblastic disease. These are all um, causes of hyperemesis gravidarum. Features would be that they'll have severe persistent vomiting with fluids and electrolyte abnormalities as well as ketonuria and um, as well as more than 5% loss of pre-pregnancy weight. So by definition, the, um, the definition of hyperemesis gravidarum is that you'll have severe persistent vomiting with fluid and electrolyte abnormalities and ketonuria. So if you see uh, a, a a vignette where there's a pregnant patient that she's just been vomiting a lot and you see changes on her um, on her chemical uh, labs and you'll see electrolyte abnormalities and uh, ketonuria that is hyperemesis gravidarum so how do you work these patients up you want to do orthostatic vital signs laying down standing up and then serum electrolytes BUN creatinine thyroid function tests as well, and urine analysis. And how do you treat these patients with dietary modification? You want to obviously hydrate them. You want to give them something, an anti-emetic, a natural anti-emetic like um, ginger, and uh, pyridoxine with or without uh, doxylamine. It is a severe form of pregnancy-induced nausea and vomiting that complicates approximately 1% of pregnancies these patients have a higher beta HCG level secondary to an increase in placental mass, especially around 10 to 12 weeks. So when the beta HCG levels are higher, uh, for all pregnant women is going to be between 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so that's when they're going to have the, the most amount of uh, nausea and vomiting. Okay, so uh, I think we covered that. Um, remember, nausea, vomiting, excessively that it causes lab changes, and it also causes ketonuria, hyperemesis gravidarum. All right. Next one is gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, so molar pregnancy. Clinically, molar pregnancies present with abnormal bleeding with or without passing of hydro uh, hydropic tissue. There's abnormal uterine enlargement with an increase, uh, with also uh, gestational age. So the uterine enlargement is greater than the gestational age. Um, so there'll be, uh, let's say 20 weeks and, or not even maybe 15 weeks pregnant, but their uterus looks like they're almost full term. That's exaggerating, but that's more or less how it is. Uh, theca luten ovarian cysts, they'll present with that. It can also present with hyperemesis gravidarum, which we just mentioned, abnormally high levels of beta HCG for gestational age and hyperthyroidism. Diagnosis is through an ultrasound as well as serum beta HCG concentrations. The management for molar pregnancy would be a dilation and suction curatage as well as histiopathological confirmation of a mole. And the serum beta HCG levels post evacuation is used to detect uh, postmolar metastatic gestational trophoblastic disease. So, if they still have high levels of beta HCG, you want to go back and start looking for any type of problems that that molar pregnancy could have uh, done. As well as contraception, uh, you want to do contraceptive methods because. 
you don't want your beta HCG levels to falsely rise thinking that you have uh, some kind of post-gestational trophoblastic disease when re in reality you just got pregnant again. So you'd want to put them on oral contraception just to make sure that you're able to draw labs uh, a couple of weeks later and um, you'll see lowering levels of the beta HCG and that's a good sign. So complete moles are usually symptomatic due to markedly increase in beta HCG. Partial moles are less symptomatic due to lower beta HCG levels. Uh, complete moles uh, the, by definition is that in a complete mole you'll have two sperm that fertilizes the ovum but the ovum lacks genetic material and a partial mole means that two sperms fertilize a haploid ovum and that causes a triploid karyotype like a 69 uh, xxx or a 69 xxy or 69 xyy so you want to for benign it's a, so these um so the molar pregnancy is benign but it may persist despite the uh, treatment and become a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia that's why you want to keep checking out that beta hcg levels and monitoring them uh, with uh, uh with um um bear, uh, Pregnancy contraception, sorry. The thecalutin lutein ovarian cysts are going to resolve spontaneously after treatment of a molar pregnancy. And that's about it for, mo uh, for molar pregnancy. Now, malignant gestational trophoblastic disease, this again occurs after a normal molar pregnancy or an abortion. All forms are present with irregular vaginal bleeding. You'll have an enlarged uterus and pelvic pain. The irregular vaginal bleeding is can be seen eight weeks postpartum, and that's that's abnormal. So you want to suspect gestational trophoblastic disease if you see vaginal bleeding happening um, eight weeks postpartum. Malignant gestational trophoblastic disease can be either due to an invasive gestation gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, which is locally invasive or a choriocarcinoma, which is highly metastatic. Most commonly, it's metastatic to the lungs. So they'll have chest pain, dyspnea, hemoptysis, and chest x-rays are gonna show multiple bilateral infiltrates of various si uh, shapes and sizes. Um, confirmation of the diagnosis is usually, it's, it's done with quantitative beta HCG levels. All right, so what are some of the prenatal infections? So assessing maternal health infections and, import, and, and exposures is gonna be an important part of the first prenatal visit. So there's gonna be a standard set of screening lab tests done in every pregnant patient. So at the first prenatal visit, patients are gonna be routinely tested for blood type. So they're gonna be either blood type A, AB, B or O and it and their RH status, whether they're positive or negative, and the presence of any kind of red blood cell abnormal antibodies, like an antibody screen is done. The antibody screen is particularly important if they are uh, RH negative in, and they've had multiple gestations. So identifying um Identifying a um, sexually transmitted infection is going to be very important. Uh, most maternal fetal transmissions are preventable with proper, proper treatment. So all pregnant patients should receive the following screen. They should all have an HIV screen. And you'd want to do this at the first prenatal visit. And you want to repeat the screening in the third trimester only if they're high-risk patients. Uh, another one that they should be screened for is hepatitis B virus and C virus, but it's not recommended unless they've had a history of intravenous drug use or HIV or any kind of unexplained liver disease. So reserve that hepatitis B virus and C virus screening for those high-risk individuals. 
uh, chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea with a nucleic acid amplification test, test, all high-risk sexually active women, especially if they're less than 24 years old with uh, a new sexual partner or with multiple sexual partners or with a history of STDs should be screened for gonorrhea. The treatment is low risk. Treating this will have a decreased risk of um, premature rupture of membranes. They'll have a decreased risk of preterm labor or chorioamnitis. And asymptomatic bacteria, bacteria, that's a funny name, is uh, treating and screening for this is done in the first trimester as a 40% of risk of progressing to pyelonephritis. So you want to screen for bacteria. So do a um, UA just to um, decrease the risk of a pyelonephritis. Um, so what are some of the tests for pregnant patients? So all patients, all of them, should have a cervical cytology as it fits with patient's routine screening. So that doesn't change. Uh, a uh, rhesus type and antibody screen, um, hematocrit, hemoglobin, and uh, mean corpuscular volumes are done, rubella immunity, varicella immunity, urine culture, syphilis testing, hepatitis B, chlamydia, HIV, the influenza vaccine during, vaccine during the flu season, and uh, genetic screenings for cystic fibrosis, as well as Down syndrome testing. All patients should be screened for those or tested for that. Now, specifically at-risk patients, you should check thyroid function only if they're symptomatic and in persons with family history or family or personal dysfunction of their thyroid or associated conditions that have uh, thyroid dysfunction like uh, diabetes, um, TB, tuberculosis for at-risk patients, toxoplasmosis, serology for at-high-risk patients, um, hemoglobin electrophoresis for patients with high-risk ethnic backgrounds or an MCV of less than 80, unrelated to iron deficiency, that's a high-risk patient, and also lead levels for those that are at risk-based history, like if they live in older homes. Now, the uh, CDC is going to rep- uh, is recommends that all pregnant women without, um, without um, contraindications should receive the influenza vaccine during the flu season, and it can be given at any trimester. So that's always a right answer if it's an option choice, which of the following uh, should this patient be vaccinated with, and if, I mean, if the influenza vaccine is there, go ahead and put it in because that's most likely the most right answer. Okay, vaccines in women of childbearing potential. So what are some of these vaccines? So routine vaccines during pregnancy would be your Tdap, your um, inactivated influenza vaccine, and that's it. Now, vaccines that are given in special circumstances, remember hepatitis B and C if they're high risk patients or hepatitis A if also if they're high risk like if they're in a community that um, uh, there's a increased prevalence in hepatitis A then go ahead pneumococcus during the second and third trimesters if they're at high risk H influenza in asplenic patients um, meningococcus if they're high risk or if they're between the ages of 19 to 21 line- living in a college dorm room and have never been vaccinated before 16 years old. And then you have your anti-D immunoglobulin or your RD uh, negative women. So if they're negative, you want to give them anti-D immunoglobulin. So what are some of the vaccines that are not recommended during pregnancy? You don't want to give an hepatitis, uh, sorry, you don't want to do uh, HPV. Um, you want to stop any type of hepatite, um, sorry, uh, HPV vaccines in patients found to be pregnant during the series and continue after delivery. So you just, if you're doing it, um, 
uh, HPV vaccine and they become pregnant, stop giving them the vaccine and wait until um, after pregnancy. Uh, an MMR, you want to avoid that during conception for four weeks after vaccination. Uh, varicella, you want to you don't want to give them varicella to avoid conception for four weeks after vaccination. And smallpox, you don't want to vaccinate them against smallpox or any type of live attenuated intranasal influenza vaccines. Um, so what I meant by avoid conception for four weeks um, after vaccination just means that if you are given those um, vaccines, MMR, varicella, smallpox, or live attenuated uh, intranasal uh, influenza vaccine, then you shouldn't have sex for four weeks thereafter in order to uh, prevent any type of transmissible uh, causes to the, um, to the fetus. So there you go. Now, Syphilis. Syphilis in pregnancy. Uh, screening is a universal at first prenatal visit. So you want to screen for syphilis in the first trimester. Third trimester and delivery only if they're high-risk patients. Uh, serological tests are going to be your non-treponemal versus your treponemal. Your non-treponemal are your RPR and VDRL. And either one of them may be used for screening but if they are positive, that's going to require a confirmation test from an alternative category because there could be false positives. Um, and then you have your treponemal, which is your FTA ABS. I like to remember that as fat abs for some reason, even though that's not what it means, but whatever it works for me. FTA ABS is your treponemal. That's your more specific test. Um, Treatment, intramuscular benzathine penicillin G is usually one dose weekly for three weeks. And um, also desensitization for patients that are allergic to penicillin. If they have syphilis, you want to still give them penicillin regardless of their, um, if they're um, allergic to penicillin. You just want to do desensitization. Um, pregnancy affects intrauterine fetal demise and uh, preterm labor. So those are some of the consequences of syphilis. And some of the effects that syphilis produces on the fetus um, is hepatic effects like hepatomegaly and jaundice. They'll have hematological effects like anemia and a thrombocytopenia, so low, low platelets. Um, musculoskeletal abnormalities of the long bones and failure to thrive. Okay, so that was syphilis. Now we're going to talk about group B strep infections. So how do you prevent neonatal group B strep infections during uh, pregnancy? So you first want to screen with a rectal vaginal culture, but that has to be done at 35 to 37 weeks. It's uh, three to five weeks prior to the estimated delivery date. So you want to culture the rectum and the vagina, and it's the most sensitive screening method of choice is a rectal vaginal culture um, three to five weeks before their estimated delivery date. So at the end of the trimester, of the third trimester. Indications for treatment would be a prior birth to an infected or affected with early onset of group B strep disease. So if they've had that before, you'd want to um, prevent it. Um, also, group B strep bacteria or group B strep urinary tract infections anytime during or currently uh, during the pregnancy, regardless of other of treatment. Um, if they, um, but if they've had any of those, if they've had um, group B strep in a prior pregnancy or group B strep that's current in this pregnancy, you don't need to screen for them. You just go straight into uh, to, um, treating them. Don't even culture it, just treat them. If they've had group B strep positive within five weeks of labor, um, as well as if they're an unknown group B strep status, plus one of the followings. So if they're less than 37 weeks gestation and you don't know if they've had a previous uh, GBS, just, just um, 
prevent it by treating them. Uh, if they have any type of fever intrapartum, so if they're deliver delivering the baby and they suddenly get a fever, treat them. Or if they've had rupture of amniotic membranes for more than 18 hours. If group B strep is known to be negative, then there's no need for antibiotics in um, premature rupture of membranes, but only if they're known to be group B strep negative. Um, so what's the take home here? If they've had a previous history of a, of a, of a pregnancy with group B strep, or if they currently have group B strep, or if you have no idea that they have group B strep and they're less than 37 weeks gestation or they're having a fever during delivery, then you go ahead and treat them. Otherwise, um, no. Otherwise, you want to screen. Um, but screening, again, remember, is rectal vaginal culture at 35 to 37 weeks, before, uh, three, which is three to five weeks before pregnancy. Uh, prophylaxis, the first line treatment, again, is penicillin. Prophylaxis should be given four hours prior to the delivery. If the patient is group B strep positive or unknown and has to undergo a C-section, prophylaxis is given only if there is rupture of membranes. And then alternatives to penicillin would be like ampicillin, cefazolin, clindamycin, or vancomycin. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a hazy subject here which is the best thing to do uh, some books say that you want to go ahead and give them penicillin desensitization and then give them penicillin others say that uh, that mode of treatment is too time consuming and costly so you want to just go ahead and give them other alternatives to penicillin but I would just do that just in case because that's just been what's been the answer always. So that's my take on that. Um, next one would be rubella. So rubella immunity is evaluated as part of the prenatal panel. You want to give an MMR postpartum, um, so after they've delivered the baby, in non-immune women. Also, routine vaccination has led to eradication in the U.S. So MMR isn't really, uh, I'm sorry, rubella really isn't a big problem in the U.S. because of routine vaccinations. Uh, MMR is given in childhood and to people traveling to the U.S. from developing countries. So women should avoid live vaccines like the MMR immediately before and during the pregnancy Though it's not associated with significant fetal harm, you still want to um, avoid it. Initially, women were advised to avoid conception for three months, but now that time has been reduced to 28 days, so four weeks prior, uh, four weeks after intercourse. You want to refrain from uh, having intercourse after, given, after being given this vaccine to avoid any kind of... Um, complications. Uh, also, women who have inadvertently received the vaccination during or shortly before pregnancy can be reassured that there is a little risk to the, to the fetus and they can actually proceed with routine prenatal care. There's no need to advise for an abortion at that point. So that's another test question that they like to ask because they'll say some, uh, some pregnant woman from recently discovered pregnant woman from a developing country comes to the U.S. and um, she didn't know she was pregnant and she was given an MMR maybe a week ago and she's very concerned for the infant and um, what would you do? And it's just to, um, you just tell the patient that, uh, that it's okay that there's very little risk to, for the fetus and you want to uh, proceed with routine care. Okay, uh, serological testing for rubella is a standard component of early prenatal care, but if the vaccination is documented, then no need to perform this as it's a proof of immunity. So um, you only want to test for rubella 
if they've never been vaccinated before. If they've been vaccinated before by rubella or an MMR, then you don't need to do it again. That's it. Okay, so next topic is going to be the prenatal testing for fetal aneuploidy. So what are some of the prenatal testings for fetal aneuploidy? Uh, we're going to break that down between uh, first and second trimester and what they are. Okay, so in the first trimester or a, compri a combined test, the timing is between 9 to 13 weeks. It's not invasive, and, but it's not diagnostic either. Second trimester uh, quad screens are done between 15 to 20 weeks, but again, they're non-invasive, so that's an advantage, but they're not diagnostic, that's a disadvantage. So what's um, more specific? You got chorionic field sampling at 10 to 13 weeks. Um, the advantages to that is that it gives you a definitive karyotypic diagnosis, but its disadvantages is that it's very painful, it causes vaginal spotting, and there's also a risk of pregnancy loss. Um, amniocentesis is done between 15 to 20 weeks. That's also the advantage is, is that it is definitive karyotypic. Um, so it gives you a definitive diagnosis. But again, it causes pain, risk of bleeding, and amniotic fluid leakage. There's also an increased risk to the fetus, to the placenta, to maternal bowels, and the maternal bladder. A second trimester ultrasound is done at the second trimester, which is 18 to 20 weeks. Um, it's not invasive. It can measure your fetal growth, evaluates the fetus anatomy, and it confirms the placenta's position. But the problem is that it cannot identify all abnormalities. So its soft markers are ultrasound findings of uncertain significance. And then you finally have your cell-free fetal DNA at more than 10 weeks. This is non-invasive. It's highly sensitive and specific for aneuploidy, but again, it's not diagnostic. Um, I, I forgot to write it down here in my notes, but an easy way to remember this for me was to break it down into what are sensitives and what are specific. Specific tests are tests that you actually take a sample or you biopsy. Whenever you have a question that says, what is the most specific test that you can possibly do? Uh, or the most definitive test, and it's always going to be to do a biopsy, uh, which is actually taking a piece of sample tissue or something. So in this case, you have two, t two um, uh, specific tests that you sample or biopsy, and it's one of them is chorionic villus sampling, and the other one is amniocentesis. Why is that specific? Because in amniocentesis, you're drawing out a sample of the amniotic fluid. In chorionic villus sampling, you're sampling a piece of that chorion, so of the villus. So in that case, those are two specific tests. All right. And then the uh, screening tests are going to be, one of them is going to have the screening test, the screening in its name, screen, second trimester quad screen. And the other one is going to be a cell-free fetal DNA, meaning that there's no t tissue sample. If it's cell-free, that means it wasn't sampled. That means it's sensitive. So how can we break this down? Well, as you can see, you have uh, the timing in weeks. So the way I broke it down is between 10 to 15 weeks, and then from 15 weeks to 20 weeks. Simple enough. So between 10 to 15 weeks, that first group has the, the, the tests with the letter C in front of it. So you have chorionic villus sampling and cell-free fetal DNA. So cell-free fetal DNA is a sensitive test. Chorionic villus sampling is a specific test done between 10 to 15 weeks. Um, sensitive tests uh, between that are going to be your... Um, your, is going to be your cell-free uh, fetal DNA and your um, uh, the, the 10, 10 to 15 weeks. Now, um, 15 to 20 weeks, sensitive is going to be a second trimester quad screen and 
then you're going to have uh, amniocentesis as your specific test. So that's the best way I can uh, put it to you. Um, it's the only way I've, I've, uh, I've learned it in my head. And obviously, if they're asking you what test to do next, um, if they haven't done a test, you always want to do a screening test first. And if they've said that they've been previously diagnosed and screened for this, then obviously the next test you're going to want to look for is a specific test. And then you just got to find out what uh, week they are in their pregnancy and and pick the specific tests. If they're less than 15 weeks, you want to do a, a chorionic villus sampling. If they're more than 15 weeks, you want to do amniocentesis. Simple enough. All right, moving on. So the second trimester quad screenings um, are going to be for the following. Um, usually it's going to be for identifying trisomy 18, trisomy 21, or neural tube or abdominal wall defects. So the, um, the screening, the quad screen is going to screen for four things, hence quad screening. So you'll have maternal serum alpha fetal protein, beta HCG, S triol, and inhibin A. Now, in let's say for trisomy 18, the maternal serum alpha fetal protein is going to be low, beta HCG is going to be low, S triol is going to be low, but the inhibin A is going to be normal. So everything's low except for inhibin A for trisomy 18. For trisomy 21, um, the mnemonic is we all fall down, but it's still kind of um, confusing because not everything is down. So you just have to know that serum alpha fetal protein is down in trisomy 21. As triol is down in trisomy 21. The ones that are increased are going to be your beta HCG and your inhibin A is going to be increased. Uh, and then for neural tube or abdominal wall defects, the serum alpha fetal protein is going to be increased. So that's the only one where alpha fetal protein is increased and everything else is normal. Beta HCG, estriol, and inhibin A are all normal. So if you see increase in maternal serum alpha fetal protein, don't look at anything else. That's a neural tube or abdominal wall defect. If you see an increase in inhibin A, that's trisomy 21 or an increase in beta HCG, that's trisomy 21. And otherwise, um, for trisomy 18, you gotta be looking at everything, which is gonna be low, except for inhibin A, which is normal. So patients with abnormal quad screens can be tested with a um, cell-free fetal DNA. So again, um, this is where it gets a little confusing because a quad screen is a screening test in itself and now you're going to do another screening test. So um, that's about all I can tell you is that you first do uh, patients with it when you they present you a patient with a quad screen that is positive or an abnormal quad screen then you can test them with a cell free fetal DNA. Ultrasound should be performed to look for fetal abnormalities and then confirmed with amniocentesis. Um, and then ultrasound must be done before amniocentesis to, to basically guide the needle to where you want to insert it. You don't want to just blindly stick needles into a patient. You just want to know where to put the needle and you'll, you have to see it. The only way to see it is through an ultrasound. Okay, cell-free fetal DNA. What are the indications for cell-free fetal DNA? If uh, Remember we said that this is usually done before 15 weeks gestation. Or in the, in, the, in the table, it's actually after 10 weeks. So it could be after 15, but I just have it in my head that it's before, but whatever. Um, for cell-free fetal DNA, um, remember that's a sensitive test. It's done... If you have an older patient, such as a, a mother who's older than 35 years old that's pregnant with an abnormal maternal serum screen test or sonographic findings that are associated with fetal aneuploidy, 
previous pregnancies with a fetal aneuploidy or a paternal balanced Robertsonian translocation. So if you have any of those, um, go ahead and do a cell-free fetal DNA test. Um, the the cell-free fetal DNA is going to screen for trisomies 21, 18, and 13, and sex chromosome aneuploidies, as well as uh, to determine the actual sex of the fetus, if it's male or female. Uh, Cell-free fetal DNA has a sensitivity of around 99% and specificity for detecting trisomy 21, so it's very, very good for Down syndrome. Uh, It has a it has a more than 92% sensitivity for trisomy 18 and a more than 80% sensitivity for trisomy 13. A normal, te- normal test generally is reassuring and has a decreased level of uh, decreased level uh, decreased rate of invasive tests, sorry. An abnormal test is confirmed with chorionic villus sampling in the first trimester and amniocentesis in the second trimester. Um, patients who do not meet high-risk criteria for cell-free fetal DNA can undergo a first trimester combined test um, or a second trimester quad screening test. So let's talk about the second trimester quad screening test. Um, All pregnant women should have oral glucose tolerance tests at 24 to 28 weeks, and high-risk patients like marked obesity, a family history of diabetes may receive that earlier. So second trimester screening, always want to do oral glucose tolerance test. Then you have a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein testing. Um, It's a major protein produced by the fetal yolk sac, the liver and the GI tract. Maternal serum alpha fetal protein is measured at 15 to 20 weeks and optimally is preferred to give it between the test for it around 16 to 18 weeks to screen for fetal abnormalities. So maternal serum alpha fetal protein screening, there's an increased in MSAFP or decreased in the alpha fetal protein. So an increased in maternal serum alpha fetal protein um, is caused by either open neural tube defects like anencephaly or an open spina bifida, ventral wall defects like emphalocele's or gastroschisis, and multiple gestations. A decrease in maternal serum alpha fetoprotein would be like aneuploidies, like trisomies 18 and 21. Less commonly, it's going to be increased, less commonly increased uh, in fetal congenital nephrosis and benign obstructive uropathies. There's an increase in maternal serum alpha fetal protein, then you want to carefully do an ultrasound for gestational age evaluation to confirm the number of gestations and to give an accurate gestational age as the interpretation depends on accurate gestational age. So if you have an increase in, in, in maternal serum alpha fetal protein, you, you just want to confirm um, how many gestations do they have uh, or they've had, and um, their gestational age. All right, so uh, cardiac ab- uh, abnormalities. Most fetal congenital cardiac abnormalities can be detected by a second trimester ultrasound screen. Next topic would be choriamnitis and an intraamniotic infection. So choriamnitis is an intraamniotic infection. The risk factors would be prolonged rupture of membranes, prolonged labor, an internal fetal or a uterine monitoring device, or the presence of genital tract pathologies, like, and as well as nulliparity. So prolonged rupture of membranes is a risk factor, and that's more than 18 hours in between the time of rupture and birth. You diagnose this with a maternal fever of more than 38, which is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, plus more than one of the following. So you'll need one of these maternal um, features like a tachycardia of more than 100, uterine tenderness, malodorous or purulent amniotic fluid or vaginal discharge, and white blood cells that are more than 15,000. Fetal tachycardia is going to be more than 160 per minute. 
Treatment would be broad-spectrum antibiotics and delivery. IV broad-spectrum antibiotics like ampicillin, gentamicin, clindamycin should be used. And you want to give oxytocin to accelerate labor. Uh, C-section is used to, um, to, for standard obstetric indications. Uh, antipyretics are used to decrease maternal fever, which in turn improve fetal tachycardia. And um, also the treatment is delivery, if I didn't mention that before. Uh, complications would be in the, in the mother would be uterine atony, postpartum hemorrhage, and endometriitis. In the neonate, it would be a premature birth, infections, encephalopathies, and um, cerebral palsy and death. So those are what can happen with chorionitis. It can also occur in patients with intact membranes. Usually it's polymicrobial, so vaginal or enteric flora, and an ascending infection from the vagina that moves up to the cervical canal into the uterus and spreads through the amniotic fluid. Amniotic membranes, the placenta, and uterine decidua. The amniotic fluid does not need to be purulent or malodorous to make the diagnosis. Tocoliasis is contraindicated in this condition regardless of fetal age. So you have antipartum fetal surveillance. Um, so when do you do a non-stress test, a biophysical profile, a contraction stress test, or a Doppler sonography of the umbilical artery. So let's uh, dissect each one of these. So antipartum fetal surveillance. So a non-stress test is an external fetal heart rate monitoring for 20 to 40 minutes. Um, more, than 20 in, more than two in 20 minutes of at least 15 beats per minute with an amplitude that lasts more than 15 seconds at each, um, at each one. A not, um, the normal result would be a reactive test in more than t with more than two accelerations. And, and, and an abnormal test would be a non-reactive test that has less than two accelerations with recurrent variable or late decelerations. Um, so you just basically put the heart monitor on there and just hope to see something. That's a non-stress test. A biophysical profile would be a non-stress test plus an ultrasound to assess one of the following. You want to assess amniotic fluid volume, fetal breathing movement, fetal movement, and fetal tone. And you want to give two points per category uh, is normal, and zero points if there's abnormal, and the maximum amount of points is 10. So a normal is 8 to 10 points, and abnormal results is uh, anything below that. So equivocal would be 6 points, abnormal would be no points, 2 to 4 points, or if they just have oligohydramnios, because that does uh, check for amniotic fluid volume. And finally, you have a contraction stress test, which is an external fetal heart rate monitor during spontaneous or induced situations like um, giving them oxytocin, nipple stimulation, or uterine contractions. Um, normal results would be no late or recurrent variable deceleration. So if you don't see any kind of decelerations after that, that's normal. Abnormal would be late decelerations with more than 50% of contractions. So if any kind of deceleration occurs in any of these tests, that's abnormal. A Doppler sonography of the umbilical artery is used for to evaluate the umbilical artery flow and the fetal intrauterine growth restriction. And um, a, high a high velocity diastolic flow in the umbilical artery is normal. And obviously if it's decreased or absent or reversed, it's abnormal. Uh, antipartum fetal surveillance is going to be performed in pregnancies with high-risk fetal demise due to either risk factors in the mother like hypertension or diabetes or in the fetus if they've had a post-term pregnancy or intrauterine growth retardation. And most common surveillance modality is going to be a biophysical profile. Patients with gestational hypertension need weekly biophysical profiles starting at 32 weeks. Decrease in fetal movements is subjective and non-specific symptoms 
that may be benign or like let's say a normal fetal sleep cycle or an omni om, uh, ominous sleep cycle where you have like let's say CNS hypoxia and that needs assessment with the above tests starting from a non-stress test. So a non-stress test, remember reactive non-stress test is a baseline of 110 to 160 beats per minute. Uh, moderate variability between 6 to 25 per minute with more than two accelerations in 20 minutes and each peaking more than 15 minutes above baseline that lasts more than 15 seconds. That's a reactive non-stress test. Non-reactive stress test means that it didn't meet any of those criteria. Simple as that. To assess for fetal status and identify fetuses at risk for ad adverse outcomes, uh, it's usually performed in high-risk pregnancies and maternal or fetal comorbidities like Graves' disease and fetal growth restriction starting at 32 to 34 weeks gestation or when there's loss of perception of fetal movement in any pregnancy. During a non-stress test, the heart rate of a well-oxygenated fetus is going to increase with fetal movement or basically with accelerations and heart rate is going to be measured while monitoring for spontaneous movement. A reactive non-stress test, there's a highly negative protective value to rule out fetal acidemia. Uh, fetal heart rate accelerations are the product of fetal sympathetic nervous systems, which measure, which matures at about 26 to 28 weeks. And it's extremely, and extremely premature do not demonstrate accelerations. So if they're premature, they're not going to have any kind of accelerations. A non-reactive non-stress test is most, common, most commonly caused uh, by a fetal sleep cycle. So just because it's non-reactive doesn't mean it's abnormal. It could just be that the baby's sleeping. The fetal sleep can last for about 40 minutes. Typically, a non-stress test is performed for 20 minutes, but in cases of non-reactive, perform a 40 to 120 minute uh, non-reactive, uh, um, a uh, stress test to ensure fetal activity not captured, um, outside the sleep. So vibroacoustic stimulation is going to be used to awaken the fetus and allow time, a timely test. So basically what am I saying here? I'm saying that a non-reactive stress test can be due to the baby sleeping Babies can sleep for about 40 minutes, or the fetuses, I'm sorry, fetuses can sleep for about 40 minutes, minutes at a time. So you either want to do a, another um, non-stress test, and just instead of it being for 20 minutes, go 40 to 120 minutes to make sure that it, the baby wakes up. Or you can do vibroacoustic stimulation, which basically like wakens up the baby and allows you to do a test. Um, I think I would prefer the longer, <laughs> the longer test, 40 to 120 minutes and let the baby sleep and, uh, see what happens. All right. Fetal hypoxia is due to placental insufficiency and fetal cardiac or neurological abnormalities, high false positive rates and low positive predictive values, and it cannot rule out fetal acidemia. Uh, there's need the need for further evaluation with a biophysical profile or a contraction stress test is when both are equivalent in assessing fetal status and are selected based on the availability of resources and relevant contraindications. Biophysical profiles performed if labor is contraindicated, perform a C-section in patients with a placenta previa with these tests are normal, when the tests are abnormal. Okay. So a biophysical profile, let's talk about that. What is it? Um, there's five portions of a biophysical profile. There's a non-stress test component, amniotic fluid volume component, fetal movement component, uh, fetal tone component, and fetal breathing movement component. So the non-stress test part is... Uh, when you, when is it normal is when you see a reactive fetal heart rate monitor. Um, 
when you're checking the amniotic fluid volume, you'll see a single fluid pocket that's more than two by one centimeter of amniotic fluid index, that's more than five. And um, so that's normal. For fetal movements are normal if there's more than three general body movements. Fetal tone is normal if there's more than one episode of a flexion extension test of the fetal limbs or spine. So if they're just moving around and you see the baby moving and flexing its neck and its spine, that's that's fetal tone. If you see that, that's more normal. As well as fetal breathing movements, more than one episode in more than 30 seconds is normal. So the maximum score here is a 10. So I'm guessing it's a 2 per component. Um, and a normal and um, 2... A score of two is abnormal. So nor uh, normal for each component is performed continuously, uh, perform continuous observation for more than 30 minutes. Okay. Um, all right. So a biophysical profile is performed to assess fetal oxygenation. oxygenation. A score of zero to four indicates fetal hypoxia due to a placental dysfunction like placental insufficiency. And that causes prompt, that would require prompt delivery of the fetus due to a high likelihood of fetal demise. A score of 6 to 10 is, an equi uh, is equivocal and should be repeated in 24 hours. Um, risk factors for placental insufficiency would be advanced maternal age, tobacco use, hypertension, or diabetes. And a biophysical profile is normal when there's fetal malpresentation causes a fetal growth restriction and chronic fetal hypoxia, but not an abnormal biophysical profile. The anterior placenta location, all that's normal in a biophys biophysical profile. All right, and a um, contraction stress test. So that is when you do, you make, you make the uh, stress test in a contracting state. How do you contract with oxytocin? So oxytocin infusion or nipple stimulation is sufficient enough to cause three contractions every 10 minutes. And the effect of these contractions have on heart rate, it's noted. If there's decelerations that occur at each contraction, a uh, that test is positive and the delivery is usually indicated. Contraindications same as contraindications to labor like placenta previa or a prior myomectomy. So during the contraction stress test on um, fetal heart rate tracing, um, you'll see that the tachometry, the baseline is going to show no uterine contractions. And then on the actual fetal heart rate um, monitor, It'll show more or less a baseline of about, let's say, 140 beats per minute, um, with the normal range being 110 to 160 beats per minute, per minute, and then you'll have a moderate variability of around 6 to 25 beats per minute. So it'll be like 140, and then it'll jump up to about 155, and then come back down, uh, wait a couple of a uh, couple of minutes and go back up uh, and so forth <clears throat> so but the but the point here is that your tachometry or baseline um it there's shows no uterine contractions but there's fetal accelerations now for intrapartum fetal heart rate monitoring the normal baseline heart rate again it's 110 to 160 beats per minute with a moderate variability that averages between 6 to 25, and that's maintained by fetal brain's autonomic control to the heart. Fetal tachycardia, then, by definition, would be a fetal heart rate of more than 160 beats per minute. And um, very testable question, common causes of fetal tachycardia would be chorioamnitis, a fetal fever, maternal hyperthyroidism, medication use like terbutaline, and abruptio placenta. Uh, fetal anemia causes a sinusoidal fetal heart rate tracing, and that shows smooth, undulating waveforms that have no variability. So um, it's kind of hard to uh, describe it, 
but you'll just see uh, waves, just these uniform, perfectly formed waves consecutively one after the other that go from, let's say, 120 to 130 beats per minute, and it just continues on, regardless of uterine contractions. Okay, so intrapartal fetal heart rate monitoring. So we're gonna see, we're gonna talk about early, late, and variable um, changes. So early changes in relationship to the contraction, there's gonna be a symmetric relationship to the contraction. The heart rate is gonna be symmetrically to the contraction. The nadir of deceleration is gonna to correspond to the peak of the contraction. And there's going to be a, grand, a gradual more than 30 seconds from the onset of the, the, of, the, the, of the nadir. Sorry, The etiology is fetal head compression for early, um, for early, um, early accelerations or uh, decelerations, obviously. Uh, and it can be normal or fetal heart rate tracing. So in this case, you'll see, um, well, in a, it, it, it's it's not a deceleration, but well, it is, but it happens right, um, right at the contraction level. So you'll see that as the contraction goes up, um, you'll have uh, a mirror image of the heart rate going down, and then it the heart rate will recover back to baseline as soon as the contraction is over, and that is an early. That's a relationship to the contraction in early uh, stages. Late stages would be if there's a delayed com uh, compared to, delayed um, heart rate um, compared to the contraction. So you'll see the contraction first, and then you'll see a delay where the nadir drops and the heart rate drops. And the nadir of the deceleration occurs after the peak of, con of contraction. So it's kind of like... Uh, it's delayed, so it's, it, that's pretty easy to remember. And um, the etiology for that would be a uteroplacental insufficiency. Um, and then variable would be that it can't be necessarily associated to the contraction. So there can be a contraction and there can be a, a deceleration of the heart rate um, before, after. It just doesn't, doesn't really correlate to the contraction. And um, the etiology behind that is cord compression, oligohydramnios, or cord prolapse. Um, so early decelerations are due to fetal head compression, and that stimulates the vagus nerve. And when you stimulate the vagus nerve, there's a decrease in fetal heart rate. Um, this occurs when the anterior fontanelle is in close contact with the cervix and the cervix is greater than five centimeters dilated and at station zero. And there's no treatment needed if there's a normal baseline rate with moderate variability and no late or variable decelerations. It present, uh, present and as does not indicate fetal hypoxemia. So there's no treatment really. Fetal, uh, early decelerations is, um, it's just due to fetal head compression. Um, late decelerations, however, that's due to placental calcification, and that, that causes uteroplacental insufficiency, which leads to a contraction and transient fetal hypoxemia, and that will lead to a late deceleration. So if it is a fetal reflex to transient hypoxemia. So a late deceleration means that you're, the fetus is not getting enough blood supply, not getting enough oxygenation, so it's going to react according to that lack of oxygen, and um, that's why it happens late, later on. It's not, uh, it's not perfectly correlated to the contraction. Variable decelerations are abrupt fetal heart rates that decrease to an adir following a rapid return to baseline. The duration and the depth of each de deceleration can be quite variable. So... Um, so yeah, it's just like um, if you look at it in a um, in a fetal heart rate strip, the usually in early or late um, uh, decreases in heart fetal heart rate, they have like a slow wave that's somewhat uniform to the contraction, but if you see it in variable stages, you'll see a very sharp 
acute wave that goes down, uh, the heart rate will go down. And uh, if you see it in a longer strip, that relationship of how low the heart rate went down, um, it varies. So that's the variable decelerations. It's an abrupt fetal heart rate that's decreased in the nadir that rapidly returns to baseline. And that duration of death is of each deceleration is variable. All right, cord compression is also caused by variable decelerations. An amniotomy or artificial rupture of membranes is going to cause a release of amniotic fluid. And that is a mechanical compression that occludes or compresses the umbilical artery, and particularly during a contraction. That's going to lead to an increase in fetal systemic vascular resistance and uh, an increase in blood pressure, uh, which causes fetal baroreceptor activation to fire and decrease the pulse rate and decrease the blood pressure. Uh, cord compression can impede fetal blood flow. Uh, obviously, you compress the cord, you're not going to get enough oxygenation or blood to the fetus. It's an intermediate variable deceleration is associated with less than 50%, 50% of contractions, so less than 50% of contractions. It's well tolerated by the fetus and do not typically cause fetal hypoxia, which will but will require close observation without intervention. Recurrent variable decelerations occur with more than 50% of contractions, and they do require treatment as fetal acidosis can develop with an increasing in frequency and severity of the decelerations. Maternal repositioning then will have to take place, and that would be first line, because um, the position of, let's say, left lateral position to a left lateral position, because if they're just, um, if they're just laying on their back, um, that can cause core compression and decrease in blood flow to the placenta. So the first thing you want to do is have the patient uh, lay on their left lateral position to take away any pressure on that cord. Uh, amnio infusion is going to be second line if that maternal repositioning fails. As the cord compresses, it can result from amniotomy and loss of amniotic fluid. Hence, installation of saline into the that amniotic sac may decrease the cord compression and variable deceleration. So, what they're saying is that. Um, which is also an option choices in, in new world, um, is that amnio infusion is done if maternal repositioning doesn't correct the deceleration. Um, in the actual exam, they would sh tell you that they tried maternal repositioning, it didn't work, what do you do next? You want to actually infuse the placenta with saline, and that's amnio infusion. Okay, then instrumental vaginal delivery would be done next. Um, if they're, if they're fully dilated at 10 centimeters and you never want to use oxytocin in these cases because it can increase the contraction strength and frequency and that can worsen variable decelerations. So nuchal cord is the next one. It's a cord around the neck. It's associated with recurrent variable decelerations and abrupt decreases in fetal heart rate with below the baseline of varying depth and duration. But it's not adverse for fetal outcomes. It is a common finding on ultrasound and at delivery. So um, for fetal descent, um, the negative numbers are uh, above, the fetus's head is above the um, level of the isch ischial spine and uh, the positive numbers are below. So the closer the baby um, gets to being expulsed, they're already in positive numbers like plus one, plus two, plus three. And if it's still in, in, in the pelvis um, and it's in the early stages, it's at minus three, minus two, minus one. Okay, so for antipartum bleeding, the differential diagnosis of antipartum bleeding would be in if they're having normal labor, uh, in, they could have intermittent pain with contractions and a small amount of blood tinged mucus. That's called the bloody show, uh, but that's normal. 
Uh, next would be placental abruption, and that's a sudden onset of vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain, and that shows up with as a hypertonic tender uterus that uh, will be in tachycystole, so they'll have more than five contractions in 10 minutes with frequent uterine contractions. So you'll see bleeding with frequent uterine contractions that is uh, a placental abruption with pain, with placental pain, um, abdominal pain. Then you have placenta previa, which is a painless vaginal bleeding, and the ultrasound with the placenta covering the cervical os. It's a painless bleeding, and it's um, uh, it's a previa, so all the previas are going to be painless. Um, uterine rupture is a sudden onset of vaginal bleeding with constant abdominal pain and a cessation of uterine contractions with a loss of fetal station and fetal deterioration. So... In this case, you'll see the baby go from, let's say, a negative one or negative two, or I'm sorry, a positive one to a negative number. It'll retract itself back into um, into the uterus, which is not normal. Also, you'll see like uh, irregular contours of the uterus. Um, and it's just the baby that's free floating um, inside uh, the uterine sac. Um, and then you have vasa previa. <clears throat> which is a painless vaginal bleeding that occurs with rupture of membranes and fetal deterioration, and that is a sinusoidal tracing or bradycardia. Um, so again, all the previas are painless. Um, placenta previa is the pre the placenta is covering the cervical os. Vasa previa would be <clears throat> the um, actual cord uh, that's being shown, that's previewing itself. Okay, um, evaluations of antipartum breathing, antipartum breathing, bleeding, sorry, would be a speculum examination first to confirm the, and quantify the bleeding and to inspect the lesions, lacerations, and cervical dilations. Then you'd want to do a transvaginal ultrasound, which is the best imaging modality to evaluate a pla uh, placenta. So abruptio placenta or placental abruption, the risk factors would be maternal hypertension or preeclampsia, eclampsia, and abdo abdominal trauma. Um, also, they can have a prior placental abruption as well as cocaine and tobacco use. Um, those are the classics. Uh, clinical presentation would be a sudden onset of vaginal bleeding with abdominal or back pain and high frequency, low intensity contractions with hypertonic tender uterus the diagnosis is primarily based on clinical presentation and ultrasound is not required for the diagnosis. It's uh, used to rule out a placenta previa that can show retroplacental hematoma. So, uh, so if they ask you, they give you the uh, presentation of a maternal hypertensive preeclamptic or eclamptic patient's with an abdominal trauma that likes to sniff cocaine or smoke and suddenly comes to you with back pain, uh, that's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need an ultrasound. So if they ask you what's the next best step, it's to uh, do, uh, it's, just, it's, it's nothing, it's just diagnosis. So premature detachment of the placenta from the uterus as a result of rupture of the maternal decidual vessels, um, that's the cause of the premature detachment of the placenta. It's because the vessels are prematurely ruptured. Uh, the, ble the bleeding at the decidual placental interface is going to sometimes be self-limited and it's pretty much clinically insignificant. Um, there are more severe cases where bleeding is persistent and it dissects the placenta off of the decidua. And in that case, it's progressive and the uterus then becomes distended and tender and then bleeding. And that bleeding becomes very apparent and significant and that can lead to a hypo hypovolemic shock and DIC. That's basically due to the tissue factor that's released by the decidual bleeding it has a larger area of detachment, and larger area means larger risks of complications. And then patients can appear stable until about 20% of the blood, uh, until about when the blood loss is more than 20%, 
and um, that will be hypo that will cause physiological hypervolemia in pregnancy. Um, blood may have a uterotonic effect, which is usually frequent but has regular contractions. They're very large. A, a very large separation can lead to a fetal hypoxia and a preterm delivery. Fetal heart rate abnormalities um, are then caused by it, like a loss of variability of the fetal heart rate and its final fetal demise. Now, how would you manage hemorrhagic shock in this case? So the first step would be obviously to give aggressive fluid resuscitation with crystalloids. Then you'd want to place the patient in a left lateral decubitus position if the patient is stable to displace the uterus off of the aortic clavicle vessels and maximize cardiac output. That's what we were talking about earlier, um, that you always want to put the patient first into that lateral decubitus position. Um, then you can do a blood transfusion for persistent bleeding, or if they become hypotensive and unresponsive to fluid resuscitation. Finally, CBC should be repeated after the administration of IV fluids to determine if the, transmution, uh, if the transfusion of cross-matched blood is appropriate. All right, so the next topic is placenta previa. So in a placenta previa, the risk factors would be, again, a previous placenta previa, a prior C-section or other uterine surgery because that causes scar tissue and things tend to stick to uh, scar tissue, uh, as well as a multiparity and advanced maternal age and smoking. So how does this clinically appear? It appears as painless third trimester bleeding and diagnosis and management is basically a transabdominal uh, sonogram that's followed by a transvaginal sonogram and no inner, there's no intercourse or digital vaginal examination in these patients because um, it can actually traumatize and cause a premature uh, rupture of membrane. Usually this is diagnosed during the prenatal ultrasound between 18 to 20 weeks and it occurs when the placenta implants itself over the internal cervical os. So that should follow up with an ultrasound, uh, which shows a resolution of the placenta previa, or you can plan, uh, plan that out so they can be modified accordingly and you have to give uh, pelvic rest, uh, restriction can be lifted. So you just basically have to keep doing ultrasounds to make sure that that placenta previa is um, not becoming more apparent or is uh, resoluting Coming more, it's good fixing itself, but it's pretty much not going to most of the time. So management would be a speculum examination with a transvaginal ultrasound, and both you do not want to penetrate the cervix because it's uh, do you um, you don't want to penetrate the cervix, and it's safe. So that's the speculum examination and the transvaginal ultrasound. Um, so it requires a C-section. So this uh, placenta previa will require you to have a C-section at 36 to 37 weeks. Um, so either late preterm or early term due to a risk of hemorrhage from the placenta and its implantation site during labor. And because the cervical changes and uterine contractions can cause the partial placental detachment. Now contraindications due to risk of antipartum hemorrhage would be a vaginal delivery Contraindication to vaginal delivery, as if the placenta was more than two centimeters from that internal cervical os, it's not a contraindication though for vaginal delivery. So what that means is that if the uh, placenta is um, less than two centimeters away from the uh, cervical os, that's not a contraindication to vaginal de delivery. So you, you, if it has like a little lip, that's just off of the edge right there, that's fine. It's just when it's really and when it's really almost effacing the, um, the cervix where it's a problem. <clears throat> okay, next one would be um, uterine rupture. Risk factors again for uterine rupture would be a previous uterine surgery, previous uterine rupture, uh, cesarean delivery or myomectomy, because again, um, surgery, 
previous surgeries cause scar tissue. Scar tissue tends to stick to things and weaken the area, um, and then it can lead to rupture. There's also an induction of labor or prolonged labor can cause a uterine eruption, uh, uterine rupture, and uh, congenital uterine abnormalities as well as a fetal macrosomia. A huge baby can uh, rupture the uterus. So clinically, on presentation, there's vaginal bleeding, intra-abdominal bleeding, causing hypotension and tachycardia, so um, a shock-like uh, picture with fetal heart decelerations, and that's uh, it's basically showing you that the fetus is in distress. Also, there's loss of fetal station, like we said earlier. They'll go from a, a positive number, like a plus one, and they'll retract into like a negative two. And then um, you'll actually palpate and feel fetal parts on abdominal examination with a loss of intrauterine pressure because the, the uterine just ruptured and you lost the pressure within the uterus. Um, sometimes you won't even hear heart sounds because where you put the ultrasound uh, wand, it won't pick up the heart sound for the, for the fetus because it's not in the abdomen. It'll be um, in the higher portion, upper portion of an abdomen because it's just free floating in there. So those are all things to consider with uterine rupture. Now, um, clinical features often presents with focal intense abdominal pain prior to rupture that is relieved by the rupture, but it resumes shortly thereafter when diff there's a diffuse distribution of it. Also, hyperventilation, agitation, and tachycardia. Those are all signs of imminent rupture. Uh, a loss of fetal station is pathognomonic. And in patients with intrauterine catheters, there could be a loss of pressure, which may be observed, but many have uh, contra uh, contractions uh, despite the rupture. So there's a, a pretty gnarly picture on uh, UWorld of a of a uterus and you just see the baby's hand breaking free trying to claw itself out of the uh, uterus pretty cool if you're into that horror sci-fi look <laughs> next uh so prevention of fetal and maternal exsanguination is that the emer you'll have an emergency laparotomy to confirm the diagnosis and to expedite the delivery for obvious reasons so uterine surgical history and vaginal births so we're gonna, so this next topic is gonna, we're gonna say whether uh, surgery or a trial of labor is contraindicated. Okay, so for uterine surgical history and vaginal birth. So let's say they have a surgery that's a low transverse cesarean delivery um, and with a horizontal incision. Is that uh, contraindicated for um, vaginal delivery? No, it's not. Now, however, a classical cesarean delivery where the incision is vertical, yes, there is a contraindication to vaginal delivery at that point because of the increased risk of uterine rupture, uh, as well as an abdominal myomectomy with a uterine cavity entry or an extensive myomectomy that basically pr um, gives you all this surgical scar tissue left over, which uh, gives you risk for uterine rupture. So... Uh, a, a normal vaginal delivery is contraindicated. Abdominal myomectomy without uterine cavity entry, then no, that's not contraindicated. So the only two that are contraindicated are a vertical incision from a previous cesarean delivery and an abdominal myomectomy where you had to enter the uterine cavity. Otherwise, you're okay to do a transvaginal delivery. Patients with a history of classical cesarean delivery or extensive myomectomy or myomectomy with uterine cavity entry, you want to plan a C-section at 36 to 37 weeks. So if they um, come in to you with the vignette saying, oh, this patient is at, she's 34 weeks pregnant and um, she wants to do a delivery, normal vaginal delivery, yet she's had a previous she, uh, she's had a previous delivery with um, that required a myomectomy that required uterine cavity entry. What would be the next best step? And it's going to tell you all these things like 
uh, C-section or vaginal delivery is okay or whatnot. At that point, since we said that vaginal de- uh, that a myomectomy with a uterine cavity entry is present, then uh, then a regular standard transvaginal delivery is contraindicated. And at this point, you would have to do a C-section or schedule the C-section within two weeks because she's at 34 weeks. You want to schedule her to have a cesarean delivery between 36 to 37 weeks. If the if uh, present if they present in labor, then you want to perform an urgent laparotomy followed by a hysterectomy for the fetus to deliver. If it's unruptured and if there is rupture, then you want to just go ahead and repair the uterus for obvious reasons. Again, you don't want to just leave a uh, uh, unrepaired broken uterus inside so always repair that um, for vasopravia these are where in the fetal vessels transverse the internal cervical os and the amniotic membrane and that's going to cause an, a vulnerable it's going to be vulnerable to the injury during an amniotomy um, because it's, it's right there the, the, the fetal vessels they transverse so whenever there's an amniotomy it, 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 there's a risk there and that's going to cause painless bleeding and remember this is a previa all previas are painless painless bleeding and a fetal heart rate abnormality is going to be immediately after the amni- amniotomy um, risk factors would be a second trimester ultrasound showing a placenta previa that resolves by the third trimester um, and that may involve involution of the placenta parenchyma covering that internal cervical loss without involution of associated blood vessels. Fetal heart rate typically shows tachycardia because there's not enough blood flow, so it's like a reflex tachycardia, but then it's followed by a bradycardia and ultimately a sinusoidal pattern on um, a, a sinusoidal pattern. Emergency C-section if found during labor that's so if they're doing this and in the patients in labor then they have to perform an emergency c-section due to a significant risk of fetal death by exsanguination obviously you don't want that to happen uh, and then 20 percent of cases if diagnosed prenatally you often want to offer the cesarean delivery prior to the onset of labor and then bleeding into the placenta previa is maternal in origin and in vasoprevia it's fetal in origin hence the reason for rapid deterioration of the fetus so um so the difference here is that a placenta previa the problem here is um is is because of the mom because the the placenta attached itself to a part of the mom that it wasn't supposed to so it's the mom's kind of fault versus uh, a vasa previa is because the baby was moving around and caused that impingement of the umbilical cord and that's kind of the baby's fault the fetus's fault so it, it's not really a fault here nobody's at fault they're all uh, obviously nobody's doing this on purpose this is all just in origin so i like to think of it at fault or whatever just for sakes of memorization but uh, placenta previa is maternal Vasa previa is fetal. And the vasa previa obviously is going to be a faster deterioration because they're going to have a higher risk of exsanguination. Okay, next topic is placenta accreta. And these risk factors are a patient with a history of cesarean delivery and a myomectomy with a history of dilation and curatage and also a maternal age more than 35. Um... There's an antenatal ultrasound showing an irregular or absent myometrial placental interface and an intraplacental villous lakes, typically diagnosed antenatally. So antenatally diagnosed placenta accreta would be delivered by the by a planned cesarean hysterectomy and some and then one that is undiagnosed that's difficult with placenta delivery, like meaning that it doesn't detach from the uterus. Um, there could be cord avulsion, and that would actually necessi- necessitate a manual extraction of that placenta, but the placenta adherence is so great that you can rip that out and cause a massive hemorrhage, so that's not good. So a creta 
just means that the placenta itself not only attached itself to the walls of the uterus, it actually went deeper into that and attached itself to the muscular layer. So when you go ahead and deliver the baby, the placenta is going to be very, very hard to extract. And when you do extract it, if and when you do, you're going to take a long part of the muscular layer of the, of the mom and she's going to be at risk of massive, massive hemorrhaging and probably death if not surgically corrected immediately. So ectopic pregnancy is the next topic. Uh, risk factors for ectopic pregnancy would be a previous ectopic pregnancy. Like we've said before, anytime somebody's had this, uh, any kind of uh, problem beforehand, they're probably at risk of having it again or double. So a previous ectopic pregnancy, a previous pelvic or tubal surgery, or a pelvic inflammatory disease, a previous pelvic inflammatory disease. Most ectopic pregnancies are caused by prior chlamydia or gonorrhea infections, which damage the uterine tubes, and most are asymptomatic. Uh, clinical features would be abdominal pain, and obviously because the test writers are cynical, they're going to give you right lower quadrant abdominal pain to simulate an appendicitis or whatnot. So check and see. Obviously, um, a, a, beta C, a beta HCG beforehand to make sure that they're either not pregnant or if they're pregnant, you want to consider ectopic pregnancy. So they come in with abdominal pain, amenorrhea, and vaginal bleeding, as well as hypovolemic shock if it's ruptured, and cervical motion tenderness, adnexal tenderness, or abdominal tenderness. And they can have a palpable mass or not. So diagnosis would be a positive beta HCG, like we just said, a transvaginal ultrasound showing an agnexal mass and an empty uterus. Management, if they're stable, you want to give them medications like methotrexate that help uh, abort the pregnancy. And if they're unstable, you would just want to go straight to surgery. And that's not just for ectopic pregnancy, that's for anything. If a patient's stable, you can manage them conservatively unstable straight to the OR. All right, next. Ectopic pregnancy locations. So the most common location is going to be a tubal pregnancy, um, but ectopically they can be found anywhere. You can have a pregnancy in the ovary. You can have a pregnancy in the uh, interstitium of the uterus. You can have them in the cervix or even in the abdominal wall. So they could be anywhere. Um, most commonly it is the, t it, it is within the tube because of that previous, uh, STD with chlamydia or gonorrhea that's surgery that causes a, a scar tissue within the tube. And then that scar tissue, remember it becomes very sticky and that little egg can go in and stick to that wall and sperm will penetrate it, fertilize it. And you'll start having a pregnancy in a tube and that's not good. So corneal interstitial ectopic pregnancy is the next topic. This is a very, very rare type, so it's probably not testable. Specific risk factors for corneal types are uterine abnormalities like a bicornate heart-shaped uterus and an in vitro fertilization. It can cause life-threatening hemorrhagic uh, shock due to the abundant blood supply and uterine and ovarian arteries. But again, um, if they put this in, uh, don't get tripped up. If you see any kind of weird shaped uterus, they're probably pointing you in the direction of an ectopic pregnancy. And then the ultimate question there is, are they stable or unstable? If they're stable, give them methotrexate. If they're unstable, straight to the OR. Simple as that. Labor. So we're going to go into labor and the stages of labor right now. So you have three stages of labor. You have stage one, which is either your latent or your active phase of labor. The latent phase of labor is between zero to six centimeters of cervical dilation versus the active labor is finally the actively baby passing through the vagina at six to 10 centimeters. And that's a complete cervical dilation. That's stage one. Stage two would be once they're 10 centimeters and complete cervical dilation leading to delivery of the fetus that's stage two of labor. And finally, stage three of labor is the delivery of the baby. And then finally, the expulsion of the placenta. 
Abnormal prog abnormalities progress with stages one and two can be described as a protracted, uh, protracted f or arrested form of labor, which just means slower than expected. So if you see that word protracted, that just means that it's taking longer than expected. Um, if you're stuck in traffic and you don't say, oh, it's going to take me longer to get to this place. You're just going to say, I'm protracted at the moment. So protracted form of labor or arrested, which means that it's unlikely to uh, even progress at that point. All right. So arrested labor, that means that the first stage is diagnosed when there's a dilation of more than six centimeters with a ruptured membrane. And there's going to be one of the following. There's no cervical change for more than four hours despite adequate contra contractions or that there isn't any cervical change for more than six hours with inadequate contractions. In the case of arrest of labor, a C-section should be performed because at that point, remember, arrest of labor means nothing's going to happen afterwards. It stopped. It's arrested. So the only way to get out of that situation is to go in and do a C-section and take the baby out. Unfortunately, versus protracted, protracted just means that it's going to take, it's going to get there, it's just taking a little bit longer. Um, adequate contractions, contractions summing up to more than 200 monovito units for more than two hours. A monovino unit is basically the number of uterine contractions in 10 minutes times the contractile strength. Um, I really don't uh, think this is going to be uh, tested, but the contraction strength is going to equal the peak in millimer millimeters of mercury minus the baseline in millimeters of mercury using an internal pressure catheter. And there's an adequate amount of labor is a two is 200 monovito units. So I guess if you see, uh, to just remember 200 monovito units of anything, that's normal. Anything more than that is uh, too much, I guess. Uh, false versus latent labor. So contractions can either be false or they can be uh, a labor that's latent. Uh, timing. For, for timing, false labor would be irregular and uh, the contractions would be uh, false or labor, uh, irregular or infrequent versus a latent would be irregular but in, and increasing in frequency. Uh, that just means it's there, but it's just getting more and more strength. Um, and uh, the contractile strength in a false uh, labor is weak versus in a latent labor, it's increasing in intensity. As, as we said before, pain in false labor, there's no pain versus when labor is really happening, it is pain. And there is cervical change when there is actual latent labor versus a false labor, there is no cervical change. So that's important to know when um, you have a patient come in at the third trimester, somewhere about, let's say, 32 weeks, something like that, 28 weeks. And you just see them and they say, they say that they're in pain or, or not they're in pain. They just feel contractions, but there's no pain. It's weak. Um, the contractions are not even happening or irregular or infrequent. There's no cervical change. These are all signs of false labor. You can, the test question at this point is, do you send them home? And the answer would be yes. Versus if they were um, increasing in frequency, the contractions, if the strength of the contractions were increasing, if they are having pain and they are having cervical changes, then yes, you do not send them home. You just, you know, keep them there under observation and see what happens. Um, so labor uh, can be regular with painful uterine contractions that can cause cervical dilation and effacement as well as normal uterine contractions during labor that lasts every two to three minutes and last 45 to 55 seconds and have intrauterine pressures of 15 millimeters of mercury. A false labor is basically ultimately resolves without cervical dilation. Um, these are called Braxton Hicks contractions. 
uh, those reassure and you can discharge the patient home with routine prenatal care. Um, if they're having preterm labor, this is important to differentiate between a false pattern and a latent pattern, like we said above. And precipitous labor means that the fetal delivery uh, can occur within three hours of the initi uh, within initiations of contractions. The most significant risk factor for precipitous labor is going to be multiparity. So if you have a patient who's had like 16 kids and she's having another pregnancy, watch out because she can pop at any moment. So that's called precipitous labor. It is spontaneous. It's not caused by any type of medic uh, medical infusion like oxytocin. Um, it's it's just latent. It, it's not even latent. It's precipitous. It's like it's going to happen like now. So. All right, so now we're gonna talk about oxytocin. The indications for oxytocin would be to induce or augment labor, and it's also used to prevent and manage postpartum hemorrhages. Um, the adverse effects for oxytocin would be hyponatremia, hypotension, and tachycystole. Now, oxytocin, it can enhance antidiuretic hormone release, and um, that's why you get hyponatremia, because the antidiuretic hormone is going to stimulate uh, syndrome. Uh, it's going to stimulate a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, which gives you your hyponatremia. Um, so I believe there is a test test question that um, says, "What is oxytocin most um, most similar to?" And it would be ADH. Uh, all uterotonic drugs used for the induction of labor can cause tachycystole. So tachycystole, remember, is more than five contractions in 10 minutes, and that's averaged over 30 minute period. And it can also cause tet, uh, tetanic contractions, which are intense or prolonged, particularly at higher doses. Although many fe uh, fetuses tolerate tachycystole with no adverse outcome, fetal heart rate tracing abnormalities are more common with tachycystole due to insufficient uterine relaxations between the contractions, causing placental spiral artery constriction and a decrease in placental blood flow, as well as fetal hypoxia. And then consequently, tachycystole is going to be associated with an increased risk of cesarean delivery and a low umbilical cord pH, as well as neonatal ICU admission. All right, and then rupture of the unscarred uterus can occur, particularly in patients exposed to high doses of oxytocin, but it is associated with uterine abnormalities, multiple gestations, and also abnormal uh, pl uh, placental location. All right, next one would be, next topic is epidural anesthesia. So it's an important modality for pain relief and labor. Uh, the, a continuous epidural analgesia involves infusion of a low concentration of a local anesthetic into the epidural space, specifically around L2 to L5, and that's going to block nerves that are responsible for the labor pains. Uh, however, its side effect is going to be hypotension. 10% of patients are going to suffer from hypotension. That's easily treatable and prevented. Um, the mechanism of action is that it involves sympathetic nerves that are responsible for the vascular tone that's going to be blocked because you have no tone, you have vasodilation, which causes venous pooling. Venous pooling, meaning that it's just going to pool there, it's not going to go anywhere, it's going to decrease the venous return to the right side of the heart, leading to a decrease in cardiac output, just like our old Frank Sterling law. And that's, if persistent and untreated, is going to cause a placental hypoperfusion and fetal acidosis. So it's kind of a long, um, a long way to go to lead that it leads to fetal acidosis. But hypotension is basically going to cause venous pooling, no tonality in your in your veins because it blocks sympathetics, uh, sympathetic nerves. Uh, since it doesn't go to the right side of the heart, there's no output. And if there's no output, there's hypoperfusion. And then hypoperfusion causes acidosis. So how do you prevent this? Is with aggressive IV fluid volume expansion before the epidural placement. And the treatment, if there's uterine displacement, you want to position the patient on the left side again to improve venous return. 
in addition, additional IV fluid boluses or vasopressor administrations. But again, you always want to do um, the repositioning of the patient first. Uh, the, the depression of cervical spinal cord and brainstem activity occurs when the local anesthesia is going to ascend towards the head, and that's also known as a high spinal or total spinal. So if you ever heard that phrase, high spinal or total spinal, it just means that the anesthesia reached all the way up to the brain through the spinal cord. It's a dangerous complication of an epidural anesthesia, and it can happen with an intrathecal injection or overdoses of the anesthetic. There's first signs that include hypotension, bradycardia, and respiratory difficulty, and later you'll have diaphragmatic paralysis and possibly a cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, there can also be leakage of CSF fluid, and that can occur if the dura is inadvertently punctured during the epidural placement, and that's going to cause leakage of that spinal fluid known as a wet tap. So you tap it and it starts leaking, that's a wet tap, causing a postural headache that are worse when the patient sits up and improve when the patient lays down after delivery. Okay. So next topic is preterm labor. Now in preterm labor, you have risk factors such as prior spontaneous preterm delivery. Again, anytime you have a prior episode of something, you're more likely at risk of having it again. Um, or in this case, you can also have a prior pre-mature rupture of membranes, um, as well as multiple gestations as a risk factor a shortened cervical length, a cervical surgery, like a cold knife conization, and um, like, uh, and then cigarette use, or if they're over age 40, obese, or if there is, was any kind of in vitro fertilization done, those are all risk factors for preterm labor. Screening and prevention would be to measure cervical length by transvaginal ultrasound, so that's how you'd want to um, screen and prevent that, uh, um, as well as giving them progesterone and placing a cerclage on there. So um, preterm labor by age is defined as between, uh, well, not defined, but it's managed between, if it happens between 34 to 36 weeks, you want to give them uh, betamethasone as well as penicillin if group B strep is positive or unknown, like we said earlier. Um, the betamethasone, remember, is given at less than 37 weeks to those who are expected to deliver very quickly within the next week. Um, if not, then you don't have to give it to them. So it's betamethasone maybe at 34 to 36 weeks. Um, it's a steroid that helps induce um, surfactant production in the, in the lungs for the fetus um, to prevent neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. And um, so at 34 to 36 weeks, it, you should have already, the baby should have already produced its own surfactant. So it might not be uh, needed if, if they're just going to be at term, but if they're uh, preterm, less than 37 weeks, then uh, you give it to them. Okay, so if they're at preterm at 32 to 33 weeks, how do you manage those patients? Is by giving them betamethasone. You also want to give them a tocolytic, um, like indomethacin or nifedipine, and that's going to actually um, halt labor for a little bit to just let them mature as much as they can, possibly can at the last minutes, as well as giving them penicillin again if they're group B strep positive or unknown. All right, and if they're less than 32 weeks, you also want to give them betamethasone, um, tocolytics again, penicillin if group B strep positive or unknown, except this time you also want to add magnesium sulfate. Now, magnesium sulfate is going to lower the risk of neonatal neurological morbidities like cerebral palsy. It has a weak tocolytic effect as well, but it can be given mainly for neuroprotection or uh, for those who are expected to be delivered within 24 hours. And it can be given with endomethacin, but not nifedipine. You can't give magnesium sulfate with nifedipine, only with endomethacin. 
So preterm labor refers to regular contractions that occur less than 37 weeks gestation and the, that cause a cervical dilation or an effacement. Uh, risk factors would be a maternal age that's greater than 40. And tocolytics are not given if they're over 34 weeks because they're at high risk um, for more uh, for preterm labor. So tocolytics, again, are endomethacin. But endomethacin can cause illegal hydramnios and closure of the ductus arteriosus. Uh, the other tocolytic would be like nifedipine, which causes maternal hypotension and tachycardia. Nifedipine, however, is first line, um, but when given with magnesium sulfate, it can, it can suppress muscular contractility and cause respiratory depression. That's why you don't give nifedipine with, a tocal with, a, um, with magnesium sulfate. So if they're less than 32 weeks, you can give a different type of tocolytic like uh, endomethacin, but not nifedipine. So what are some of the predictors of preterm labor? You'll have shortened cervix, which is as measured by, it's gonna be measured by transvaginal ultrasound during the second trimester. And that would be a strong predictor of, of preterm labor, the shortened cervix. A transvaginal ultrasound is gonna be the first step to evaluating that risk of preterm labor. And the next one that would predict preterm labor would be a positive fetal fibronectin test. Now the fibro, fetal fibronectin test in vaginal, is found in vaginal secretions and it's usually low anywhere from 22 to 33 weeks gestation. And it's, and it's also elevated in um, fetal fibronectin concentration within this period. And it's associated with an increased risk of preterm delivery. So before and after 22 to 33 weeks gestation, uh, fetal fibronectin is normally high. And, that, and that's just not a useful test between those uh, gestational ages. So how do you prevent preterm labor? So this is, uh, this is gonna be a little uh, diagram on how to do it. So you have to ask them or know if they have a history of preterm labor. If they don't, then you do a transvaginal ultrasound and you're gonna measure the, uh, you're gonna evaluate the cervix with the transvaginal ultrasound. If the cervix is normal, you just continue on doing routine prenatal care. If they do not have a history of preterm labor and you do a transvaginal ultrasound and you notice that their cervix is short, a short cervix will require vaginal progesterone. So a normal cervix is just routine prenatal care. A short cervix would be vaginal progesterone. Now let's say they do have a history of preterm labor. What do you do next? you have to do, again, transvaginal ultrasound to evaluate the cervix, plus you wanna give progesterone injections. And those injections are given IM and during the second and third trimester. Then you also wanna do the serial transvaginal ultrasounds again in the second trimester. So, um, so you evaluate the cervix. If the cervix is normal, you gotta keep just, you just, keep doing the transvaginal ultrasounds until they reach 24 weeks. If they have a short cervix, then you do cerclage and serial transvaginal ultrasounds. And progesterone, during pregnancy, progesterone is gonna maintain the uterine quiescence and protects the amniotic membranes against premature rupture. Um, you can supplement that with exogenous progesterone. So that's what it does. If you see a vignette that asks you blatantly, what is the mechanism of action of progesterone? It's to maintain uterine quiescence during pregnancy. Um, it decreases the rate of preterm delivery in patients with short cervixes. So that's why you do a transvaginal ultrasound to evaluate the cervix. If it's short, give them progesterone. Uh, it, they don't, Progesterone does not have a tocolytic effect and has no effect on the patient if, it, if they're already in labor. So it's okay to um, give them progesterone. A cerclage, however, um, is a procedure where they place sutures or a synthetic tape that reinforces the cervix. And that's performed in patients with a history of second trimester deliveries and that have short cervical lengths. And that short cervical length 
is uh, less than 2.5 centimeters, very, very short. Next topic is premature rupture of membranes. Um, in premature rupture of membranes, the, rate, the membranes are gonna rupture before term, hence premature. Uh, the diagnosis is gonna be clinical. Um, clinical findings would be the amniotic fluid could be noted in the vagina or it's seen leaking from the cervix when, the, when they valsalva or if there's a slight fundal pressure applied. If there's a PPROM diagnosed, then the amniotic fluid sampling must be done for fetal lung in indices and mature and it's mandatory. Um, you need to do an ultrasound, a gestational ultrasound to detect fetal abnormalities and determine the gestational age as well as to measure that amniotic fluid. Uh, PPROM happens between 24 to 34 weeks normally. Uh, they have an LS ratio, a less than sphingomyelin ratio of less than two. Uh, that will require a steroid injection, and that's, again, used to accelerate lung maturity. Steroids are not given beyond 34 weeks in premature uh, rupture of membranes, pre preterm premature rupture of membranes. Long-term to uh, tocolysis is not indicated because there's an increased risk of chorioamnioitis, uh, and short-term tocolysis, tocolysis could be given to delay labor long enough for steroids to be given and promote fetal lung maturity. So that's why you want to do tocolysis. You want to just, um, you just want to stop or uh, the um, progression of labor just for a little bit, just so that the steroids um, can do their work and help. Uh, mature lung, mature, uh, induced lung maturity. So it's not used if chorioamnitis is present. It's same, same with the case of with steroids. Uh, you don't want to give them because they can cause uh, long-term uh, tocolysis can cause chorioamnitis. All right, next topic would be cesarean delivery. The indications, again, uh, we spoke about this, but it's fetal distress indicated by deceleration. Um, so if there's any kind of deceleration causing fetal distress, that's an indication for C-section. Loss of fetal heart rate variability, like in the case of fetal acidemia, where you're not getting uh, enough blood supply to the, the fetus isn't getting enough blood supply, that is a, an indication for C-section. Any type of breach presentation or multiple prior cesarean deliveries will all require a cesarean delivery. So uh, breech presentation, this occurs when the butt, when the buttocks is low uh, or the lower extremity of the fetus presents itself first into the maternal pelvis. It happens approximately in 25% of fetuses, so it's fairly common. And it happens in less than 28 weeks of gestation. Um, by 37 weeks, 4% of uh, fetuses are in breech. Risk factors would be prematurity, multiparity, any type of multiple gestations going on, uterine abnormalities, fetal abnormalities, and abnormal uh, location of the placenta. The diagnosis uh, is when the head is palpated in the fundus or the presenting part is not palpable on pelvic exam. You should always confirm your uh, findings with an ultrasound, with a transabdominal trans -abdominal ultrasound. Management would be to do a vaginal delivery of a singleton breach Fetus is generally uh, contraindicated due to an increased incidence of birth asphyxia and trauma. So if there's no contraindications to uh, vaginal delivery, um, like if they don't have a placenta previa or an active herpes lesion, you have to offer external cephalic version. Now, um, external cephalic version is used to avoid a C-section at more than 37 weeks. If the patient refuses to have an external cephalic version, um, or if you do the external cephalic version and it fails, or you have contraindications to external cephalic versions or contraindications to vaginal delivery, then you wanna just go ahead and do the C-section at 39 weeks. So let's go over some of the uh, types of breach presentations really quick. Uh, you have your frank breach, which is when um, the buttocks are presenting first. An incomplete breach when, again, the buttocks are presenting first, but one leg is flexed. 
the other one's extended. Uh, complete breach is when both legs are flexed and you're still having a buttocks presentation. Uh, single footling means that one foot is outside, it's being presented first, and double footling just means the same, but both feet are out. Okay, cephalic, external cephalic version is a maneuver to convert the uh, to convert a breach into a vertex presentation for delivery. It can be performed between 37 weeks gestation and the onset of labor, and it has been shown to reduce the rate of cesarean deliveries. Uh, document you want to document fetal well-being by non-stress test, and there should be no contraindications to the vaginal delivery. It does have a potential to cause fetal distress, however, so you want to perform only when there's arrangements being made for a backup emergency C-section. So, since it can cause fetal distress, you want to do an a uh, you want to have as your backup plan an emergency C-section already programmed just in case. Um, contraindications to external cephalic version would be. Um, any kind of indication for cesarean delivery, regardless of the fetal lie, like an incomplete breach or an estimated fetal weight that's um, macrosomic, like uh, more than 8.8 .8 pounds, then you want to do a C-section. Or if there's failure to progress during labor or if there's any type of non-reassuring fetal status, you want to go ahead and do... Um, you want to... Uh, you want to go do C-section, not cephalic version. Um, another contraindication would be any type of placental abnormalities like a placenta previa or a placental abruption, oligohydramnios, ruptured membranes, hyperextended fetal head, a fetal or uterine abnormality or multiple gestations, or any type of abnormal heart tracing. Those are all contraindications to external cephalic versions. So the way you just do it is that you um, more or less feel the head and the um, butt of the fetus um, on the uh, on the, the the mother's abdomen, and then you just try to you just try to move him or her the fetus uh, either forward or backwards to get that head pointing downward. Okay, and then you have internal podalic uh, versions, and that's pretty much the same thing, except you try to, you just go in through the cervix manually and try to um, adjust the fetus that way. Um, for preterm breech presentations, uh, these occur at more than 34 weeks of gestation, but less than 37 weeks. Uh, active labor and breech presentation is occurring, tocal, uh, then you want to do a tocolysis at 34 weeks, and a vaginal delivery if they have a singleton breech presentation, and it's contraindicated due to an increased risk of fetal asphyxia and fetal injury. External cephalic version is going to be contraindicated in active version for a breech presentation, so you want to go ahead and do a uh, C-section. All right, so let's say they're lying transversely. Um, the risk factors with that would be a prematurity, uterine abnormalities, a placenta previa, any type of multiple gestations. Physical exam, you'll see a fetal head near the mother's side or the absence of a fetal presenting part during a digital cervical exam. And you want to confirm it with an ultrasound. Most likely and most of the time they convert to either a breech or a vertex, which is more common. Um, and the presentation happens spontaneously. So you want to repeat the ultrasound at around 37 weeks to determine delivery, um, delivery management. If, uh, if they do convert to vertex presentation, then you want to just um, go on and doing a trial of labor. If they do remain in transverse lie or they convert to breach, then you want to do an external cephalic version. Um, However, if it's not contraindicated, obviously. So if they do, if you do an external cephalic version and it's successful, then you move or move on ahead and uh, continue on with the trial of labor. But if that external cephalic version is unsuccessful or contraindicated, again we go back and uh, default to C-section. Now let's talk about the more sad uh, topics of termination of pregnancies. So there are all types of abortions. 
So starting off with spontaneous abortion, by definition, this is a fetal loss before the 20th week of gestation. Risk factors would be 50% are caused by chromosomal abnormalities, which increase maternal age, especially ages more than 35. And it's associated with an increase in chromosomal abnormalities like and drugs such as alcohol and smoking, previous spontaneous abortions, infections like chlamydia and listeria, also poorly controlled diabetes can lead to a spontaneous abortion. Um, on evaluation, pelvic examination for cervix and vaginal bleeding. Um, you want to assess for fetal heart tones. You also want to do a transvaginal ultrasound to document the presence of an intrauterine product of conception and to try to attempt to visualize any type of heart or, uh, fetal heart motion or kind of any kind of motion. If there's absent fetal heart movements on ultrasound, it's the most significant indicator for fetal loss. As well, you want to do a quanti uh, quantitative beta HCG as well to measure you want to measure that, and that's usually done after the pelvic ultrasound is done to compare it with a prior baseline reading of the beta HCG. Because a single beta HCG is not very useful as it's usually elevated shortly thereafter, after a spontaneous abortion. So even if you do have an abortion, you still have a little bit of a uh, little rise in beta HCG. However, it can be helpful in cases that are not diagnostic with ultrasound or it's suspected to be in a topic pregnancy you want to go ahead and do serial beta HCGs to um, look at decreasing levels. Um, and that will confirm or like not confirm, but that will li likely be a spontaneous abortion. Serum beta HCGs will then become de undetectable by four to six weeks after an abortion. And then uh, coagulation studies. Sometimes there's retained products of conceptions and that's going to cause a coagulopathy. So let's uh, classify the types of spontaneous abortion. So they have, there's missed abortion, inevitable abortion, incomplete abortion, threatened abortion, or septic abortion. So let's go one by one. A missed abortion would, be, would present as a variable presentation with no symptoms to light vaginal bleeding. And pregnancy symptoms can be decreased. The cervix will be closed and you'll see a non-viable fetus on ultrasound. So that's, a, um, that's just a uh, abortion that you missed it. It, it happened and that's it. Uh, so that's why you're gonna have no fetus on ultrasound. Uh, inevitable abortion means that there's going to be, be, they're gonna be presenting with vaginal bleeding, uterine cramps, and a possible intrauterine fetus with a heartbeat. So they can be still alive. However, the cervical os is going to be open and ultrasound can show a heartbeat. Um, there could be rupture or a collapsed gestational sac. Uh, but since it's, the cervix is open, unfortunately, it is inevitable that they might have an abortion. That's why it's called inevitable abortion. Incomplete abortion means that there's vaginal bleeding with passages of large clots or tissues and they can have uterine cramps, and products of conceptions are, optionally, are often visualized in the dilated cervical os. So how is that cervix gonna be? It's gonna be open, and on ultrasound, you will see products of conception, often in the cervix. Um, so it'll still be there. You'll still have an open uh, cervix and a non-viable, uh, or a, a fetus who is um, has no heartbeat, but it's still there. And that's an incomplete abortion because it hasn't really uh, expelled itself yet. Threatened abortion presents itself as variable amounts of vaginal bleeding, as well as pregnancy can proceed to a viable birth. So a threatened, abor so a threatened abortion just means that it's a threat. It could happen, but since the cervical os is closed, then there could there's a, there's a, there's a, there's hope that there's not going to be an abortion, and on ultrasound you do see a viable pregnancy. Again, there's chance there's a chance that um, this will not progress to becoming an abortion, and then finally a septic abortion. Uh, you can 
more or less understand that they are going to present septically with fever, malaise, signs of sepsis, um, foul smelling, vaginal discharge. There's going to be cervical motion, uterine tenderness, um, and it's usually induced abortions. Uh, and it can be life-threatening and it rarely occurs after a spontaneous abortion. Usually the cervical os is opened and there's on ultrasound, there's usually retained products of conception that are infected, causing you to have sepsis. Okay, so um, again, um, the types of miscarriages threatened has vaginal bleeding, it has a closed cervical os and there is fetal cardiac activity. Um, but it's threatened. Um, missed abortion means that there's no vaginal bleeding. There's a closed cervical os, but no fetal cardiac activity or an empty sac. Um, inevitable abortion means that there's vaginal bleeding, a dilated cervical os, and products of conception seen or felt above the cervical os. An incomplete abortion would be vaginal bleeding, dilated cervical os, and some parts of conception are remained in there. And then a complete uh, abortion would just mean that there's vaginal bleeding, or there could be no vaginal bleeding. The cervical os is closed, and there's no products of conception. Everything was expulsed. Uh, there's a mnemonic that says... The eyes are open, the eyes. So what are the eyes? The eyes are open, inevitable abortion, and incomplete abortion, the cervical osses are going to be opened. Um, so that's a good mnemonic to remember. The eyes are open. So any abortion that begins with the letter I, like inevitable or incomplete, the cervical os is open. All right. Um, management of spontaneous abortions would be uh, classified by either threatened abortion, you want to manage by expectant management until either one of the followings, either they have a symptom resolution or progression to inevitable abortion, incomplete or a missed abortion. So you just want to keep managing them normally. Uh, again, hopefully there it was just a threat and it doesn't the threat doesn't um, see its way through resolution. Uh, incomplete, inevitable, or a missed abortion would be in a would be a hemodynamically unstable, heavy vaginal bleeding would require surgical evaluation and surgical evacuation, such as dilation and suction curettage. If they are hemodynamically stable or mildly bleeding, then you want to do expected management with prostaglandins or uh, surgical evacuation. However, if they are septic, um, you want to go ahead and do blood and endometrial blood cultures. You want to give them broad spectrum antibiotics and you want to surgically evacuate any type of contents within the uterus. So appropriate treatment should ensure complete elimination of the um, products of conception. And that can be done surgically, medically, or expectantly. Now, a uh, surgical for, is done for unstable and heavy bleeding with uh, low hemoglobin and intrauterine sepsises or those who do not desire any kind of medical or expectant management. Uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is given to prevent post-abortal endometriitis. Medically, um, treatment is those who do not want surgery, who do not want to wait for any kind of spontaneous expulsion, expectant um, delivery is those who are willing to wait and who don't who don't who don't want to wait uh, above two who are willing to wait and do not want more than two so you want to keep the patient at home and regular clinical follow-ups and a transvaginal ultrasound is used to ensure complete natural evacuation now all three methods are affected and surgery is going to achieve a more complete evacuation Repeat the ultrasound after medical or expectant delivery to uh, to uh, confirm the absence of a retained product of conception. And then hospitalization and bed rest is not indicated in the first trimester with a spontaneous or a threatened abortion. Oxytocin infusion is not used in the first trimester. It's used in the second or third trimester. 
Now, a threatened abortion, the first step is to ascertain the presence of an absence of fetus or whether it's alive or not. And you want to do an ultrasound. If it's alive, then you want to measure. Um, you want to manage and reassure with a, with a repeat ultrasound in a week afterwards. Um, you want to give them bed rest and, the, and you want to abstain them from having any kind of intercourse. Generally recommended to prevent couples from guilt if the fetus is actually lost because of that. And um, otherwise, there's no evidence or benefit of this type of intervention or outcome. No, now, a septic abortion, risk factors for septic abortions, again, are retained products of conception from either an elective abortion or a non-sterile techniques outside of the healthcare setting. So if you go to um, an unlicensed clinic or something like that, you are put at risk of having some type of bacteremia and a septic abortion taking place. It could be missed incomplete or an uh, inevitable abortion, but that's rare. Clinically, they present with fevers and chills and lower abdominal pain with bloody or purulent vaginal discharge. Their uh, uterus is going to be boggy and tender with a dilated cervix, and they'll also have cervical motion tenderness as well. A pelvic ultrasound will show retained products of conception with increased vascularity and echogenic material in the cavity within thick endometrial stripe. Management would be blood and endometrial cultures, intravenous fluids, and broad spectrum antibiotics. Surgical evacuation of the uterus, like suction curatage, and that's done closely to observe afterwards as the patient can still develop sepsis after surgery. Um, and as well as a hysterectomy if there's no type of response to the antibiotics, as well as if they start developing an abscess or if there's signs of, of a uh, clostridium infection. Complications to septic abortion would be a salpingitis, peritonitis, and septic shock. And medical, it's a medical emergency that can pro progress to death, so you do want to catch this quickly. Elective abortions, um, these are treated with misoprostol, which is a synthetic prostaglandin, and it's approved for the use of mifepristone to terminate pregnancies of less than 49 days gestation. So if they're less than 49 days, then you can, add, you can do an elective abortion with misoprostol. Intrauterine fetal demise is a death of a fetus in utero after 20 weeks gestation and before the onset of labor. It's suspected when the patient reports a disappearance of fetal movements or a decrease or a um, stag uh, stagnation of uterine size or when the fetal heart sounds are no longer heard. Risk factors are hypertensive disorders, diabetes mellitus, placental and cord complications, as well as antiphospholipid syndrome and congenital abnormalities, as well as fetal infections, such as torch infections or listeria, as well as smoking more than 10 cigarettes a day. And that cause is unknown in 50% of the cases. Now you want to do a beta HCG uh, to continue, uh, to, you want to continue monitoring beta HCG, which can continue to become elevated due to an ongoing placental production of that hormone. And a real-time ultrasound is going to be a more reliable tool to confirm the diagnosis. And that's going to demonstrate an absence of fetal movement and fetal cardiac activity. If fetal heart tones are present on ultrasound, you want to go for a non-stress test. So monitoring the coagulation profile is important. That's done after the ultrasound is done to confirm an intrauterine fetal demise as intrauterine fetal demise can cause maternal consumptive coagulopathy and a DIC. Retention of, of a, uh, another complication would be a retention of a dead fetus, which causes a gradual release of tissue factor called thromboplastin from the placenta into the maternal circulation, and that can cause a, co a chronic consumptive coagulopathy. Fibronectin levels are normally high in pregnancy and low to normal levels can be an early sign of a coagulopathy. So look for those fibrinogen levels, especially with a uh, fall in platelet counts, an increase in PT and PTT and a fibrin split product. So any suspected coagulation derangement, you wanna deliver the placenta without delay. And all coagulation, if all coagulation parameters are normal, then you wanna just manage, you wanna manage um, depending on the patient's preference, which 
it's either induction of labor or to watch expectant expectantly. So the watchful expectancy is usually in 80% of the cases which deliver um, within two to three weeks. There's a high risk of complications like chorioamnitis, DIC. Hence, that's why you want to do serial fibrinogen levels um, to see if there's going to be any type of coagulopathy. And emotion. it's also emotionally disturbing for most people. And there's also induction of labor, and that's usually preferred by patients because it's it's hard to just have a, a dead fetus floating around. So uh, most patients would just want to induce labor and get it over with versus watchful expectancy and having a dead fetus flowing around in there. It's kind of weird. Okay, then DIC hemorrhage or coagulopathy or coagulation profile with markedly abnormal uh, coagulation profiles. You want to give them fresh frozen plasma. It's important to try to find the cause of the fetal demise after the first episode in order to prevent any possible, any future pregnancies with, um, uh, to prevent any kind of uh, fetal demise afterwards. If possible, a, recur a recurrence of the same issue in any subse subsequent pregnancies, you want to do an autopsy of the fetus and the placenta um, to make sure. Now, stillbirth delivery options. So if it happens within the second trimester, you can do dilation and curatage up to 24 weeks. You can induce labor or you can do spontaneous vaginal delivery. But if it happens in the third week, or I'm sorry, in the third trimester, you, then you want to induce labor with or without doing cervical ripening, uh, as well as spontaneous vaginal delivery. And you want to repeat a, a cesarean upon maternal request if the patient has a history of a prior C-section. All right. And then vaginal delivery is preferred even in patients with a prior C-section. Cervical ripening is needed. Is if needed, is done with misoprostol or a transcervical Foley bulb, which is preferred in patients with a prior C-section, as prostaglandins are going to increase the risk of uterine rupture. Okay, so late-term and post-term pregnancy complications. So what are some of the late-term and post-term pregnancy complications? So in the fetus, you'll have oligohydramnios, meconium aspiration, stillbirths, macrosomia, and convulsions. Maternal complications would be like cesarean delivery, infection, postpartum hemorrhage, and perineal trauma. Late-term um, complications are pregnancies that are 41 weeks or beyond. So 41 weeks to 41, 41 to 41 weeks and six days, you wanna consider inducing labor. If they're post-term, meaning that there's more than 42 weeks gestation, you want to recommend to induce the labor and prevent complications. And then there's antipartum, antipartum fetal testing with a biophysical profile done frequently starting at 41 weeks, and that's used to assess fetal well-being. And then finally, late-term and post-term pregnancies are at risk of uteroplacental insufficiency. So this may show late decelerations and oligohydraminose on biophysical profile. Oligohydraminose is a single deepest vertical pocket of amniotic fluid that's less than two centimeters or an amniotic fluid index of less than five centimeters with a normal and uh, amniotic fluid index of five to 25 on transabdominal ultrasound. This is common complications of prolonged pregnancies where you have oligohydraminose. Um, the aging placenta is gonna cause decrease in fetal perfusion. The decrease in fetal perfusion is gonna to lead to a low renal perfusion. Low renal perfusion means low urine output from that fetus, and that is gonna cause oligohydramnios. So um, um, remember the back from step one, oligohydramnios is caused by a kidney problem. Polyhydramnios is caused by a um, swallowing problem. So, um, so here, oligohydramnios is because there's decreased perfusion. No perfusion means the kidneys aren't getting uh, perfused and you have your kidney problem, you have your oligohydramnios. And that is an indication for delivery, even if there's antipartum fetal testing that's normal. Now, fetal growth restrictions, these are causes of fetal growth restrictions, uh, would be a fetal weight that's in the, that is less than the 10th percentile. 
Um, asymmetric maternal factors would be like vascular diseases, hypertension, like hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, autoimmune diseases such as lupus, um, and then cyanotic cardiac diseases, as well as substance abuse like tobacco, alcohol, or cocaine are all asymmetric maternal factors that cause fetal growth restrictions. Now, fetal growth restrictions that are symmetric um, are caused by the fetus. And these would either be caused by genetic disorders like aneuploidy, congenital abnormalities like gastroschisis, uh, congenital heart diseases, and intrauterine infections such as malaria, CMV, um, rubella, toxoplasmosis, and varicella. Remember that CMV is the most common um, cause in developmental countries, in developed countries, and there's no signs in the mother. <clears throat> so asymmetric growth restrictions are from conditions that impair blood flow to the placenta. These can be caused by any type of maternal vascular disease or by malnutrition. The blood shifts from the abdominal viscera to the vital organs like the brain. Hence, they have asymmetric growth and weight is going to be affected more than height and head size. Whereas symmetric growth restrictions are genetic defects that result within the first or the second trimester, basically before 28 weeks gestation, and that causes the entire fetus to be affected. If there's no anatomical abnormality on ultrasound, then there's a decreased risk of chromosomal abnormalities. You want to suspect intrauterine infection early on in pregnancy that can cause um, affected height, affected weight, and head circumf circumference. Uh, fetal growth restriction infants are at high risk of intrauterine demise. Neonatal morbidity and mortality, including hypoxia and perinatal asphyxia with meconium aspiration and hypothermia because of the decrease in subcutaneous fat, as well as hypoglycemia, and that's due to a decrease in glycogen stores in infants that are less than 2.6 kilograms. That's managed early in frequent by frequent feeding, and hyperglycemia in very low birth weight infants is due to a decrease in insulin. Hypoglycemia causes a decrease in transfer of calcium across the placenta. The placenta. Hypocalcemia is a decrease in transfer of calcium across the placenta. Uh, polycythemia is going to be due to an increased uh, erythropoietin concentration uh, due to the hypoxia. So if you have hypoxia, you'll have a stimulated effect of producing more red blood cells, causing high erythropoietin levels. And this is more prone to cognitive delay in childhood, as well as obesity, diabetes, mellitus type 2, and coronary artery disease, as well as strokes in adulthood. <clears throat> now let's talk about shoulder dystocia. So the risk factors with shoulder dystocia would be an infant that's large for gestational age, uh, a big baby that weighs more than 4 kilos, it might have some problems and difficulties passing through the vaginal birth canal. So, 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 so shoulder dystocia and its complications are usually unpredictable and unpreventable. Prophylactic cesarean delivery isn't routinely recommended for suspected fetal macrosomia, and that's because the rate of shoulder dystocia is and its associated complications really isn't that significant. Um, to, to require a C-section versus a vaginal delivery. So then if these are caused by fetal macrosomia, what are some of the fetal, what are some of the risk factors for fetal macrosomia? Um, maternally, it would be advanced age. So the older the mother is, the more chances of, the, of her having a, a macrosomic baby, as well as diabetes, excessive weight gain during pregnancy, and a pre-existing obesity and multiparity. All right, so um, the fetal risk factors for macrosomia would be African-Americans and Hispanic ethnicities, as well as male, males and um, post-term pregnancies. Those will be the fetal causes of um, fetal macrosomia. Um, now, let's talk about complications of shoulder dystocia. So they can get fractured uh, clavicles, because of a clavicular, um, I'm sorry. So they can get fractured clavicles, fractured humeruses, an Herb Duchenne's palsy, Klumke's palsy, and uh, perinatal asphyxia. And um, 
So in order to, to have the fractured clavicle, there should be, or not have the clavicle, but you'll see a clavicular crepitus and bony irregularities, a decreased moral reflex due to the pain in the affected side, and intact biceps and grasp reflexes. Fractured humeruses in the upper arm will show crepitus and bony irregularities. There's again a decreased moral reflex due to pain on that affected side. And again, intact biceps and grasp reflexes. For Herb Duchesne's palsy, there's a decrease in the moro and bicep reflexes on the affected side. But they have a waiter's tip. And a waiter's tip is extending the elbow with a pronated forearm and a flexed wrist and finger. And again, the, there's a, the grasp reflex is intact. Um, Klumke's palsy is a claw hand, and that is extend, uh, a claw hand is an extended wrist, wrist with hyperextended metacarpophalangeal joints and flexed intrapharyngeal joints, as well as absent grasp reflex, Horner syndrome like ptosis and myelosis, and an intact moral and bicep reflexes. And then finally, perinatal asphyxia shows variable presentations depending on duration of hypoxia, altered mental status like irritability and lethargy, as well as respiratory or feeding difficulties with poor tone and seizures. <clears throat> okay, neonatal displaced clavicular flat fractures. Risk factors for those would be a fetal macrosomia, like maternal diabetics and uh, post-term pregnancies, as well as instrumental delivery, like vacuum-assisted or forceps-assisted, and shoulder dystocia can all cause clavicular flat fractures. Clinical features would be crying, uh, infant uh, pain with passive motion of the affected extremities, crepitus over the clavicle, and an asymmetric moral reflex. Diagnosis is made through an x-ray, and treatment would just be reassurance, gentle handling, analgesics uh, to calm the, pa the baby down, and to place the affected arm in a long-sleeved garment and pin sleeve to the chest and elbow flexed at 90 degrees. So kind of just like holding your arm inward and then pinning that to the chest, to a, a garment. Usually it heals spontaneously and quickly without long-term sequelae and healing is usually occurs within a week to 10 days. <clears throat> Herb Duchesne's palsy is going to be the most common type of brachial plexus injury, and the, that's an injury of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus affecting the C5 to C6, and maybe even sometimes C7 nerve roots. Um, there's weakness of the deltoid and the infraspinatus muscle that innervated by um, C5. The biceps is going to be innervated by C6, and the wrist and finger extensions are innervated by C7. So treatment involves gentle massaging and physical therapy, to prevent contractures. Prognosis is going to depend on whether the damage resulted from a mild nerve stretching or a compression, as opposed to a severe rupture or avulsion. Unfortunately, up to 80% of patients have spontaneous recovery within the past, within the next three months. If there's no improvement by three to six months, then you have to go ahead and surgically intervene, uh, but it's not necessarily curative, unfortunately. So a waiter's tip or herb de Shane's palsy, um, like we said earlier, the upper arm is adducted and it's internally rotated. So it's kind of like you, you're pointing your biceps medially towards your chest and then the elbow is uh, faced outwards laterally with the elbow extended. The forearm is pronated. So um, it's kind of like you're showing off your your triceps, you know, like when you're flexing and you have your wrist and your fingers flexed laterally. Um, and that's your Herb Duchesne's waiter's tip. Now, Clunky's palsy is an excessive traction on C8 to T1, and that's causes a rare, it's caused by a rare complication of hand paralysis. That's what it can cause. Uh, sometimes there is associated damage to the sympathetic fibers that run along C8 to T1. And that causes ipsilateral ptosis and meiosis, which is Horner syndrome. Uh, the prognosis is going to depend on whether the damage was due to nerve stretching or compression as opposed to an avulsion. And Horner syndrome also pre uh, pretends, 
portend to a suboptimal outcome. So basically, it's not a very good outcome if they have Horner syndrome. Treatment is controversial and involves gentle massaging and physical therapy to prevent the contractures. And in most cases, function does return uh, to normal within a few weeks. But if there has been no improvement by three to nine months, then you want to consider surgical intervention. And again, a Klumpke's hand is, you'll see a forearm that is supinated, the wrist is extended, and there's metacarpal phalangeal joints that are hyperextended with the interphalangeal joints flexed. So it's kind of like you're, you're making a claw. That's why it's called a claw hand. So that's Klumpke's palsy, C8 to T1. Uh, and then Horner syndrome is ptosis and meiosis. Um, so ptosis would ju just be uh, your eyelid drooping down. And meiosis is a meiotic pupil where the pupil is very uh, small and uh, constr well, it's constricted. Um, uh, and mnemonic, just in case you want to know between meiosis and mydriasis, is that if you take the word meiosis and you take the word mydriasis, the word meiosis is smaller and meiosis can fit into that smaller pinpoint pupil versus mydriasis is a longer word and you'll see it in a larger pupil. <coughs> so hope that helps. Uh, fetal and neonatal complications from maternal diabetes. and um, So let's see the complications of maternal diabetes. So let's say you have maternal hyperglycemia and it's the first trimester. Um, complications of maternal hyperglycemia in that first trimester would be congenital abnormalities like congenital heart diseases and neural, tra neural tube defects and small left colon syndrome, as well as spontaneous abortion. Uh, remember, the most important trimester is going to be the, the first trimester. So any problem there can cause serious uh, diseases and serious defects. Um, now, second and third trimesters, if there's hyperglycemia then, then you have your, your risk of fetal hyperglycemia, which then causes fetal hyperinsulinemia. When there's, high ins when there's high glucose in the mother, hyperglycemia, that means that the fetus is also having high, high glucose, and they're, they're going to have to produce high levels of insulin, so you have fetal and hyperinsulinemia. Now, if there's hy fetal hyperinsulinemia, um, that can cause a high metabolic demand, that high metabolic demand is going to cause fetal hypoxia. Hi fetal hypoxia is going to lead to an increase in erythropoiesis, like we said earlier, and cause a polycythemia. Also, uh, fetal hyperinsulinemia can cause organomegaly, so you'll have a large heart, a large liver. Um, they can cause macrosomia, <clears throat> which can lead to a shoulder dystocia and birth injuries such as brachial plexopathies, uh, clavicle fractures, and perinatal asphyxia, as well as neonatal hypoglycemia because of the um, excess amounts of insulin produced. So a combination of hyperinsulinemia and major anabolic hormones and hyperglycemia is going to lead to a disproportionate growth that's, higher, that's a higher chest to head and shoulder to head ratio. Um, so the uh, chest and shoulders will be larger than the head is. So that's why they have a higher risk of shoulder dystocia. Visceromegaly and fat accumulation, there's an increased risk of shoulder dystocia. And, and that occurs in one third of infants with, of diabetic mothers. Prevention of those complications would be like dietary modifications, uh, insulin, and or hypoglycemics. Now, postpartum hemorrhage, you have uterine inversion. Uterine inversion's pathophysiology is that it causes excessive fundal pressure and excessive umbilical cord traction. All those can lead to an inversion. How do they present with lower abdominal pain? There's going to be a round mass protruding through the cervix. So that's a classical clue on vignettes. You'll see a, they'll describe a round mass that's protruding through the cervix. And um, there's a uterine fundus that isn't palpable on trans, uh, that's not palpable transabdominally. And they can even lead to hemorrhagic shock. Now, how do you manage these people with aggressive fluid replacement? 
you want to do a manual replacement of the uterus, obviously, you want to put that uterus back in place, and you want to do a placental removal and uterotonic drugs after you replace the uterus. So that's very important. You don't do it beforehand because beforehand would be um, counterintuitive. It'll be harder to put the, placent the, the uterine back into its place. So you want to first put the uterine, first remove the placenta. I mean, sorry, you uh, first you want to uh, re see how easy it is to confuse. First you want to re replace the uterus, then you want to remove the placenta and give the uterotonic drugs. So it's uncommon, but it's potentially fatal cause of postpartum hemorrhage. Its risk factors would be like nulliparity or a fetal microsomia, placenta accreta, a rapid labor and delivery. So if it happens like way too quickly, uh, you're at higher risk for um, uterine inversion. Um, also, the there's um, immediate manual replacement of the uterus. You want to place the hand in the vagina and you want to push along the axis of that vagina towards the cervix um, because if that's delayed, it can cause a uterine edema and cervix contraction around the inverted uterus, making it more difficult to put it in. Uh, the, placenta, the placenta should not be removed before you replace it because it can cause massive hemorrhaging. And uh, then uterine atony or atony is common after the replacement and placental removal. Uh, so uterotonic drugs like oxytocin are given after replacement and the placenta removal to prevent further hemorrhagic recurrences of prolapse. Uh, uterine relaxation is going to be necessary to replace uh, hence, it's given after replacement and uterine relaxants like nitroglycerin and terbutaline can be administered to aid in the replacement of the uterus if the first attempt is unsuccessful. But it's preferable without this is an exacerbated uterine apnea. Okay, laparotomy is done if a manual replacement fails. Um, so yeah, um, one of the uh, classical findings is that you are delivering the fetus and as you're pulling and trying to extract the placenta, you'll see a, a bulge coming out and that is a prolapsed uterus. You want to immediately first put it back in place, then give the uterotonic medications. Um, and that's it. Okay. So now uterine atony, that's the next topic. This is hemostasis after placental delivery is achieved by clotting and compression of the placental site blood vessels by myometrial contraction. This is gonna lead to a failure of either postpartum hemorrhage, um, not either, it's a failure of postpartum hemorrhage. So post, primary postpartum hemorrhage occurs less than 24 hours after delivery. Postpartum uterine atony, the risk factors would be uterine fatigue from prolonged and induced labor. Chorioamnitis can also be a risk factor. Uterine over distension and multiple gestation like poly and um, polyhydramnios, as well as a retained placenta. Uh, the uterus becomes unresponsive to oxytocin from oxytocin receptor oversaturation. Then operative forceps assisted or vaginal delivery uh, or precipitous delivery and hypertensive disorders. Those are all um, uterine over distension risk factors of uterine atony. Clinical features, the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage and is an, and it, it um, presents itself as the classic enlarged soft and boggy uterus that's poorly contracted uterus. So they'll explain that in the vignette, exactly. Uh, um, uh, it's like a baggy, boggy, soft, very large uterus over the, um, under the umbilicus. Uh, you'll, you'll feel that, and that's basically uterine atony. Management begins with assessment of the vital signs. So IV fluids are given to maintain the systolic blood pressure, and it's often a transfusion of appropriate blood products. Uterotonic drugs such as oxytocin is going to be first line and it's given IV. Second drug can be added if this 
and uh, the massage doesn't work. Um, and then methyl, methyl ergonavine causes smooth muscle constriction, uterine contraction, and vasoconstriction, and these can cause hypertension. It's contraindi- so it's contraindicated in hypertensive patients. Any patients with hypertensive shouldn't be given methyl ergonavine. A carboprost, a synthetic prostaglandin, that's going to stimulate uterine contractions and that can cause a bronchoconstriction as well, as well as a, um, not as well, I'm sorry. So it's contraindicated in asthma, um, carboprost. So hysterectomy is your last resort, but it should not be delayed if they're unstable or have massive hemorrhages uh, in order to prevent death. Now we're going to talk about the postpartum period. Uh, Normal findings in the postpartum period would be transient rigors and chills, peripheral edema, uh, lochia rubra, which is a pinkish fluid, um, uh, uterine contractions and involutions and breast engorgement. Those are all normal findings. Um, So you might get a question that says, this patient's complaining of, of... leakage of fluid of, of blood but it's not blood it's uh, lochia rubria um it, they're also having um uterine contractions and rigors and chills maybe even fever and breast engorgement and you're thinking is this normal or not and yes it is normal uh, routine care would be to give lactation support Serial examinations for uterine atony bleeding, uh, parent, perineal care, voiding trials, and pain management. So normal postpartum period is characterized by several physiological processes that can be mistaken for signs of pathology. So that's why it's most likely going to be a question. So if you see any of those, remember that's all normal in the postpartum period. Uh, transient rigors and chills occurs immediately after the delivery of the placenta. It's thought to be due to a thermal imbalance. Um, but if you think about it, um, it's kind of easy to understand. The placenta is just a bag of blood, in essence, and it's also f- that blood is usually warm. You remove that uh, placenta and you're just removing uh, a, a percentage of heat from your body because of the blood, and that causes um, rigors and chills. Lochia during the first few weeks after delivery. Lochia rubra occurs, which is a red or reddish brown vaginal discharge, and that's normal shedding of the norm of the uterine decidua and blood, and small blood clots can also be present. So again, that might look very bad, but actually it's completely normal. It's called lochia rubra, happens within the first few days and it's normal after three to four days that discharge that's really dark and red becomes thin and pink and brown color and that's now instead of calling it lochia rubra you just call it loca lochia serosa and then after two to three weeks the discharge then becomes white or yellow and that's called lochia alba and uh, so heavy vaginal bleeding that soaks more than two pads per hour is considered excessive. So in that case, then uh, you might want to think of something else, but any type of lochia, a white, yellow, um, discharge two to three weeks, that's normal. Pink or brown three to four days after that's normal is lochia serosa. And a few first few days, first for, yeah, sorry. First few days after delivery, that's lochia rubra when it's red or reddish brown. All right. The uterus contracts and it becomes firm and globular. The fundus typically is one to two centimeters above or below the umbilicus. Postpartum urinary retention. These are important. So um, risk factors for postpartum urinary retention would be nulliparity, uh, prolonged labor, perineal injuries, regional analgesia, the cesarean deliveries, instrumental vaginal deliveries, And clinically, they present with an inability to void a sensation of bladder fullness, dribbling of the urine or small volumes, and manage with analgesics, and you want to encourage ambulation and urinary catheterization. And that reassures that that it's temporary and reversible. 
it's very common to have urinary retention after delivery the regional because the regional anesthesia is going to decrease motor and sensory impulses of the sacral spinal cord and that's going to suppress micturation reflex and it's going to or it's going to decrease the uh, bladder tone which decreases the detrusor tone the pudendal nerve you get pudendal nerve palsy from injury or uh, periurethral swelling that all causes um that all causes uh, a decrease in detrusor tone. Diagnosis is the inability to avoid six hours after the delivery or six hours after the removal of an indwelling catheter after a C-section with bladder catheterization more accurate than bladder ultrasound. And that shows more than 150 milliliters of urine confirming the diagnosis. Now, postpartum endometriitis is our next topic. You want to suspect uh, puperbetal infection if fever is more than 100.4 outside the first 24 hours postpartum. Um, it's a known postpartum fever, um, and then delivery is considered normal. So uh, what I just said, sorry if it was choppy, um, that it's basically within within 100.2 after delivery, it's normal, and if there's an infection involved, it would be greater than 100.4. So those are very, very, very small, um, minute differences, but greater than 100.4 degrees, that's usually due to a, a puerperal infection versus um, 100.2 is normal. Endometriitis is the most common cause of puerperal fever on the second and third day postpartum. So that's another reason to think of endometriitis as being a cause two to three days after delivery. Um, and the causative organism with endometriitis would be a polymicrobial um, cause due to a combination of gram positives and gram negatives, also combinations of aerobic and anaerobics, and occasionally other organisms are going to be mixed in like chlamydia and mycoplasma. And it's commonly isolated organisms include group B strep, group D strep, staphylococcus epidermidis, and E. coli, Neisseria gonorrhea as well, Gardnella vaginalis, Bacteroides fragilis, and Peptostreptococci, as well as Peptococci. Risk factors for endometriitis include, but are not limited to, prolonged rupture of membranes of more than 24 hours, prolonged labor of more than 12 hours, a C-section, and the use of inner uterine pressure catheters or fetal scalp electrodes. Obviously, those are all um, causes of, of uh, postpartum endometriitis or an infection. Um, clinical features of postpartum endometriitis, obviously, you have your fever as well as uterine tenderness. The lochia smells bad, so foul-smelling lochia with uh, nor which is a normal lochia with a vaginal discharge occurring after the pregnancy, but it resolves in two weeks and it's never foul smelling. That's what normal lochia is. It's normal vaginal discharge. It doesn't smell. So if you, lochia starts smelling, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a clue right there uh, for an infection, as well as an increase in white blood cell count on labs, uh, leukocytosis. And the treatment here would be um, IV clindamycin with an IV aminoglycoside such as gentamicin. Um, rectovaginal deliveries. Now, obstetric injuries is the most common cause of a rectovaginal fistula, which may present in the first two weeks postpartum. The rectovaginal fistulas occur most often at the third and fourth, um, after a third or fourth degree laceration with an inadequate wound repair or the wound breakdown and infection. It's found less in industrialized countries. Um, rectal vagin uh, vaginal fistulas occur due to poor intrapartum care and a prolonged second stage of labor, which causes ischemic pressure and necrosis of that rectal vaginal septum from fetal head compression. A rectal vaginal fistula presents with incontinence of flatus um, as well as fecal maternal th uh, material through the vagina, as well as malodorous brown tan discharge, because that's your feces coming out of the vagina, 
Diagnosis is usually confirmed visually. I mean, it's it's very disgusting, but that's what it is. You can imagine it this way. It's feces coming out of the vagina. It's foul smelling. It's brown, tan. Um, shows dark red velvety rectal mucosa in the posterior vaginal wall. And if there is a rectal vaginal fistula suspected but not clearly visible, then you need to do an endoscopy to help visualize it. And you need to treat it definitively or surgically repair it um, for obvious reasons. Um, hypertension in pregnancy is... To diagnose hypertension during pregnancy, the blood pressure should be increased on two separate occasions, taken at least four hours apart. Um, pregnancy showing marked systemic vasodilation is going to lower the blood pressure by 5 to 10 millimeters from baseline during the first trimester, and it returns to pre-pregnancy levels during the third trimester. So what are some of the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? So chronic hypertension um, is a systolic blood pressure of more than 140 or a diastolic pressure of more than 90 prior to the conception or 20 weeks gestation. Gestational hypertension is a new onset of elevated blood pressure at more than 20 weeks gestation with no proteinuria or end organ damage. Preeclampsia is new onsets of elevated blood pressure at more than 20 weeks gestation and the proteinuria or signs of end organ damage. Eclampsia would basically be everything from preeclampsia, but you add grand mal seizures to that. And then chronic hypertension with a superimposed preeclampsia would be somebody with chronic hypertension and one of the following either a new onset proteinuria with worsening of the existing proteinuria at more than 20 weeks gestation, a sudden worsening of hypertension, or signs of end organ damage. So what are the, uh, what are the pregnancy-related risks of hypertension? So maternal risks would be superimposed preeclampsia, a postpartum hemorrhage, gestational diabetes, a bruptial placenta, and a C-section, uh, fetal uh, risk factors would be fetal growth restrictions, uh, perinatal mortality, preterm delivery, and oligohydramnios. The risk of preterm labor and other complications may be due to an increase in systemic vascular resistance and arterial stiffness that leads to a placental dysfunction. That may also be due to expedited preterm deliveries due to unstable maternal or fetal complications. Uh, gestational hypertension is going to be a new onset of hypertension of more than 20 weeks gestation with no proteinuria or end organ damage. Methyl dopa is going to be used for chronic hypertension in pregnancy. So that's very important to know. They're going to ask you what, what, what drug do you want to give uh, during pregnancy if the patient has hypertension. And they're going to list you a bunch of drugs. The most uh, common one that you need to pick is methyl dopa. So the next topic is going to be preeclampsia. So preeclampsia, by definition, is a new onset of hypertension with a systolic blood pressure that's more than 140 on two separate occasions, more than four hours apart, or a diastolic blood pressure that's more than 90 at more than 20 weeks gestation, plus proteinuria and or signs of end organ damage. Severe features of preeclampsia would be more than 160 systolic blood pressure, or, 100, or more than 110 um, diastolic blood pressure for more than 15 minutes on two separate occasions, more than four hours apart. Um, they also have thrombocytopenia, elevated creatinine levels, elevated transaminases, pulmonary edema, and a new onset of visual or cerebral symptoms. So uh, platelet counts here are gonna be less than 100,000 with a creatinine of more than 1.1 with headaches. And uh, there's also going to be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia that's going to lead to an increase in lactate dehydrogenase levels. Risk factors for preeclampsia include a maternal age that's less than 18 years old or more than 40 years old. Um, also multiple gestations, nulliparity, a pre-existing diabetes and chronic kidney disease prior to the preeclampsia. If there's proteinuria detected or on urine dipstick, um, there's more than one plus protein that has a high false positive and, ho and false negative during pregnancy, that, but still needs to be confirmed either way by either a urine protein creatinine ratio or a 24-hour urine collection for your total protein. And that would be the gold standard to quantify the proteinuria. 
um, remember, a urine protein creatinine ratio or a 24-hour urine collection. Uh, diagnosis is confirmed if the urine protein creatinine ratio is more than 0.3 or a 24-hour urine uh, collection gives you a total protein excretion of more than 300 milligrams in 24 hours. Complications, uh, maternal complications would be, although all patients are at risk of eclamptic seizures, hepatic rupture and DIC, as well as hemorrhagic or ischemic strokes, pulmonary edema, and myocardial ischemia, and in those with severe symptoms are at increased risk. Uh, you have fetal complications that can cause a disruption of blood flow through the uterine arteries, or it leads to an abrupt placenta, oligohydramnios, and a fetal growth restriction or low birth weight, even if there is delivery at term due to a chronic utero, utero placental insufficiency. So what would be the treatment of preeclampsia? Uh, the, initially, the goal here is to stabilize the mother by administering antihypertensive medications. Antihypertensive medications such as hydralazine, labetalol, or nifedipine, and these are used um, to lower the blood pressure acutely, uh, and this will decrease the risk of strokes. Uh, other drugs like magnesium sulfate are used to prevent and treat eclamptic seizures. Labetalol is going to be a beta blocker and an alpha blocker that cannot be given to a patient with a decrease in pulse as it can further decrease causing dizziness and lightheadedness. Um, hydralazine is a vasodilator and can be given to patients with low pulses. Oral nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker, but it cannot be given to patients that are vomiting because it's oral and then it won't have an effect. Uh, loop diuretics um, like furosemide are typically used in patients with preeclampsia that have pulmonary edema. Like they, they'll show crackles or dyspnea on, on, um, on their physical exam. And that's it for preeclampsia. Now, eclampsia is basically severe preeclampsia with seizures. So their features are the same, hypertension, proteinuria, headaches, visual disturbances, right upper quadrant and epigastric pain. But they'll also have three to four minutes of tonic-clonic seizures that's usually self-limited. You wanna manage them with magnesium sulfate, with antihypertensive agents, and you wanna quickly deliver the fetus after the stabilization of the patient. Um, with uh, magnesium and antihypertensives. So as the seizure lasts for about three to four minutes and it's self-limited, hence the treatment is gonna be directed at preventing future seizures. If magnesium sulfate doesn't control the seizure, then you wanna give them diazepam or phenytoin, and that's uh, indicated second line. Approximately 10% of pregnancy-related maternal mortality is gonna be due to eclampsia from an abruptio placenta, DIC, and cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, you can also have magnesium sulfate toxicity. Uh, they present with um, mild, moderate, or severe features. The mild features would just be nausea, flushing, headaches, and hyporeflexia. Um, others, moderate, would be uh, areflexia, hypocalcemia and somnolence and severe features of magnesium toxicity would be a respiratory paralysis or cardiac arrest. Treatment for magnesium toxicity is to first stop giving them magnesium, obviously, and then you want to give them something to reverse it, and that's called IV calcium gluconate, and you want to give that in a bolus form. Magnesium is solely excreted by the kidneys so renal insufficiency patients have a, an increased risk factor for magnesium toxicity. Um, this, leads with, this, this, this leads to patients with an increased risk of creatinine that can be lowered, uh, that their dose needs to be lowered and needs to be closely observed. Magnesium levels should be checked after the initiation or infusion, and the infusion rate should be adjusted accord, accordingly in all patients as well as concomitant use of calcium channel blockers and magnesium can potentiate a hypotension. You have HELP syndrome, which is a life-threatening pregnancy complication that can be severe preeclampsia. Abnormal placentation leads to a systemic infl uh, inflammation, and that leads to an activation of coagulation cascades and complement cascades, and that will then lead to circulating platelets that are rapidly consumed and a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia 
which is particularly detrimental to the liver. That's going to lead to a hepatocellular necrosis, specifically a centrilobular necrosis, uh, hematomas formations, and thrombi's in the portal capillary system. That'll all lead to an increase in liver function tests, liver swelling, and distension of the hepatic Gleason's ca capsule. They, all, they like sometimes to ask you, what is the, um, what's the uh, mechanism behind um, the um, right upper quadrant pain in HELP syndrome? And that would be distension of the liver capsule or Gleason's capsule. Um, and that causes right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain. A microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is going to cause an indirect hyperbilirubinemia due to the um, red blood cell fragmentations on the, uh, that's going to spill out um, and cause your indirect hyperbilirubinemia. On blood smear, you'll see those fragments. And that can also cause ARDS. Now, HELP syndrome, remember it is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and liver platelets, and low platelets, sorry. Uh, clinically, their features is preeclampsia, uh, nausea and vomiting, as well as right upper quadrant abdominal pain. On labs, you'll see a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with elevated liver enzymes and a low platelet count. Um, the treatment here would be to deliver as soon as possible, give magnesium for seizure prophylaxis, and to give antihypertensive drugs. Treatment, how do you treat first? First, you want to stabilize the patient with antihypertensives or magnesium prophylaxis for seizures. And once they are stabilized, the only definitive treatment is to deliver the infant or deliver the fetus. Uh, coagulation disturbances recover spontaneously after the delivery. There's prophylactic platelet transfusion um, can be considered if the platelet count is low, less than 20,000, or if the platelet count is less than 40,000 and a C-section has to be done. Uh, delivery should occur promptly at more than 34 weeks gestation uh, at any gestational age and with abnormal fetal testing or a severe or worsening maternal status. All right. So then you have pulmonary edema and preeclampsia or eclampsia. And in these cases, there's generalized atrial uh, vasospasm or systemic hypertension. That vasospasm or systemic hypertension is going to lead to an increase in afterload uh, against which the heart is pumping. So remember that the in arterial vasospasms or hypertension systemically, uh, the arteries are clamped down. So blood can't go out of the heart as easy. So it stays inside the heart. And that blood that stays within the heart is called an afterload. So afterload increases even though the heart is still pumping. Um, and that back flows into the lungs, causing an increase in pulmonary capillary pressure, and finally pulmonary edema. Um, also low levels of albumin will cause pulmonary edema, and a decrease in renal function can cause pulmonary edema. And also an increase in vascular permeability can lead to uh, pulmonary edema. So a lot of things causing pulmonary edema here. Um, and preeclampsia or eclampsia. So clinically, clinical features would be sudden onset of dyspnea, hypoxia, and crackles. <clears throat> it's a rare life-threatening complication. So treatment is supplemental oxygen, fluid restriction, and diuresis in severe cases. Uh, fluid restriction and diuresis must be used with caution as the plasma volume is effectively decreased through, the thir uh, through third spacing and placental perfusion can be compromised. All right, next one is causes of hyperandrogenism in pregnancy. Um, so the diagnoses of hyperandrogenism in pregnancy would be like a luteoma, a thecolutin cyst, or a Krukenberg tumor. <clears throat> so a luteoma, ma um, maternal clinical features here would be a yellow or a brown yellow mass that has often areas of hemorrhages or large lutein cells, uh, solid ovarian masses on ultrasound, which are 50% of the time bilaterally, and that's going to regress spontaneously after delivery. Um, the fetal virilization risk is very high for luteomas. Um, 
for a theca luten cyst, this would be a bilateral, this would show up as bilateral ovarian cysts on ultrasound, and it's associated with a molar pregnancy and multiple gestation, and they tend to regress spontaneously after delivery again, with a low risk this time of fetal virilization. And then finally, a Krukenberg tumor is bilateral solid ovarian masses on ultrasound with metastasis from a primary um, GI tract cancer. And this, again, is high risk. So if they have any type of like um, gastric carcinoma uh, that can metastasize to the ovaries, that's a Krukenberg tumor. Um, if it goes to the belly button, that's a Sister Mary Joseph tumor. Um, and if it goes to the clavicle, I've, I forgot that one. Um, but yeah, the, those are metastatic, um, metastatic um, GI cancers. So the Krukenberg tumor uh, is a high risk for fetal virilization. Okay, hyperandrogenism in pregnancy is usually cons caused by ovarian masses. A luteoma is more common in African Americans. It's most of them are asymptomatic, and around thirty percent are symptomatic. They're going to be, if they're symptomatic, they'll have new onset of hirsutism and acne due to an increase in testosterone levels, an increase in dihydrotestosterone and androstenedione. Diagnosis for a luteoma would be through ultrasound. That's the gold standard, and those masses are typically six to ten centimeters in diameter. Management would be to clinically monitor these patients with an ultrasound regard, uh, to uh, see if they regress after delivery. And you also want to monitor the size as it rarely can cause a mass effect like hydrocephalus or an obstructive labor, as well as ovarian torsion. And you also want to inform the patient that symptomatic luteomas can cause virilization of female fetuses. So um, if they have that, you should try to counsel the patient upon these uh, adverse effects. And then surgery is indicated only if the mass effects happens and there's torsion. All right, Krukenberg tumor is next. This is a tumor that we said it was a metastasis from the um, GI tumor. It causes unintentional weight loss, abdominal pain, and other comp uh, complications. There's also biopsy and surgery indicated if there is going to be a malignancy suspected. Lupus nephritis must be distinguished from preeclampsia as both lupus and preeclampsia can mimic each other as ster corticosteroids can aggravate lupus. Um, ANA titers may be weakly positive in normal pregnancy, but it's increased in lupus. Lupus nephritis shows red blood cell casts along with proteinuria. And if there is proteinuria that persists after pregnancy, you want to do a renal biopsy to diagnose lupus nephritis. Um, medications that are contraindicated in pregnancy would be lithium, isotretinoin, or vitamin A. Uh, isotretinoin, sorry, not vitamin A. And then uh, ACE inhibitors. So lithium is the lithium, lithium use in the first trimester is going to give you an increased risk of congenital heart defects which is classically the Epstein's anomaly. In patients with stable bipolar disorder, you wanna slowly taper them off of lithium because abrupt discontinuation of lithium can cause a relapse. So that'll also be a site question where they'll say, this patient has a history of bipolar disorder, they're taking lithium and they're concerned because they wanna become pregnant or they're pregnant what do you do next? And you want to slowly taper them off of lithium. Okay, isotretinoin can be associated with many, many congenital abnormalities like cranial facial dysmorphisms, heart defects, and deafness. And it must not be taken by women of reproductive age unless there's two effective forms of contraceptions being used for at least a month prior to initiating the treatment. So they should be already on, con on, on two different forms of contraception before even thinking of doing, using isotretinoin. Contraception must be continued during treatment for one month after isotretinoin is discontinued. Uh, in addition, patients must have a pregnancy test the week before beginning the treatment and should have a periodic pregnancy test during that therapy 
just to make sure that the patient is not pregnant. There is no known effects of inhaled betamethasone and albuterol. ACE inhibitors can cause fetal growth restrictions. It can cause renal failure, pulmonary hypoplasia, and oligohydramnios, and skeletal abnormalities if it's administered in the second or third trimester. Um, and then finally, uh, here we're going to talk about hemolytic diseases of the newborn. And these are indications for prophylaxis of anti-D immunoglobulin administration for an unsensitized Rh negative pre pregnant patient. So what are some of the indications for prophylactic anti-D immunoglobulin administration for unsensitized Rh negative pregnant patients? It's a mouthful. Uh, well, indications would be at 28 to 32 weeks of gestation. So that's when you want to give it. Um, within 72 hours of delivery of an RH positive infant or a spontaneous threatened or induced abortion, if, have, if there's been any ectopic pregnancies or if there's an ectopic pregnancy, if there's a high data titiform mole, if there are chorionic venous samplings or amniocentesis, abdominal trauma, second or third trimester bleeding or external cephalic versions. Those are uh, indications to give prophylaxis anti-D immunoglobulin for RH negative pregnant patients. So antipartum prophylaxis isn't needed if the father is a known RH negative uh, patient. If the patient is already sensitized, like they already have high antibody titers, uh, then anti-D immunoglobulin is not helpful. You want to just closely fetal monitor um, the fetus for hemolytic diseases. Um, the initial timing is 28 to 32 weeks because the half-life of anti-D immunoglobulin is about six weeks, which would cover any potential future exposure to fetal red blood cells through most of the third trimester. Um, so children born to an anorexic mother is the next one. If the patient has corrected eating disorders and she's at increased risk of pregnancy, complications due to a chronic nutritional deficiency, patients with current or past anorexia are at high risk of giving birth to infants that are premature, um, that are small for gestational age due to intrauterine growth retardation or both miscarriages, hyperemesis gravidarum, C-sections, or postpartum depression, but not postpartum psychosis. Children born to anorexic mothers often do suffer from poor growth and intellectual disability, and complications in mothers in general would be like osteoporosis, elevated cholesterols and carotene levels, um, cardiac arrhythmias like a prolonged QT interval, a youth thyroid 6 syndrome, hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunctions that result from an inovulation or amenorrhea and estrogen deficiency, and finally hyponatremia secondary to excess water drinking, often because of it's the only electrolyte abnormality, but the presence of other electrolyte abnormalities indicate purging behavior. Now breastfeeding. Um, breastfeeding is an exclusive form of nutrition for infants that are less than six months of age. The benefits to breastfeeding are gonna be protection. So number one would be protection against uh, things such as necrotizing enterocolitis, diarrhea, otitis media, respiratory tract infections, and UTIs. And the benefits to the mother would be low, a decreased postpartum bleeding, more rapid uterine involutions, a decrease in menstrual blood loss, increase in child spacing, an early return to pre-pregnancy weight, and a decreased risk of breast, of breast and ovarian cancer. Now, what are some of the contraindications to breastfeeding? Some of the indications would be, or the contraindications maternally would be an active untreated TB infection. The mothers may start breastfeeding two weeks after they're given anti-TB therapy. Um, as well as maternal HIV infection in developed countries where formula is readily available, uh, herpetic breast lesions that are active, a varicella infection less than five days before or two days after delivery, uh, chemotherapy or ongoing radiation therapy, and active abuse of alcohol or drugs. So those are about the only contraindications to breastfeeding. 
Um, and in an infant, the only contraindication to breastfeeding would be if they have galactosemia. <clears throat> so active and substance use, active substance use until patient can demonstrate that she has been off of illicit drugs consistently, then they shouldn't breastfeed until they know until you know that that patient is really not taking any drugs. Alcohol use and abuse, if the mother with alcohol abuse should be advised against breastfeeding as well. Occasional maternal alcohol use is not absolute contraindication. You want to counsel the mother to limit her alcohol use to an occasional drink and should not breastfeed for at least two to three hours after the intake. Smoking is not an absolute contraindication to feeding, However, women should be strongly encouraged to quit smoking as it increases the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, which is a bad thing, and the development of respiratory allergies in infants. So although it's not contraindication, please stop smoking. Influenza, uh, women with H1N1 or other strains should be separated from the infant while febrile, but they should be encouraged to pump their own uh, breast uh, milk. Hepatitis B and C patients are contrary to previous teachings. Hepatitis C is actually not a contraindication to breastfeeding, although hepatitis C uh, virus RNA is detectable in maternal colostrum. The transmission of hepatitis C via breastfeeding has never been documented, so it is strongly recommended that mothers with both hepatitis B and C breastfeed whenever possible. However, they should also be strongly counseled to abstain abstain if their nipples are cracked or bleeding. So, don't want that. Common problems related to lactation would be uh, if they have breast engorgement. This would be a bilateral symmetrical fullness or tenderness uh, or warmth of the breast. These are problems that happen after lactation. They can have engorgement. They can have nipple injury, like abrasion or bruising, crackling or blistering from poor latching. Um, a plugged duct causing focal tenderness and firmness or erythema with no fever. Uh, a galactosile, which is a subareolar mobile well-circumscribed non-tender mass that also presents without fever. And mastitis, which is tenderness or erythema with fever, and an abscess with symptoms of mastitis with a fluctuant mass. Breast engorgement can occur three to five days after delivery when the colostrum is replaced by milk, and it can occur any time during breastfeeding due to milk accumulation with inadequate drainage. Particularly, it's common early in postpartum period when the milk production is at the most, uh, intrapartum IV fluids administration can be can also cause breast edema and exacerbate the pain. And it can also occur due to a rapid cessation of breastfeeding. Uh, physical exam, you'll see, uh, you, we won't see any type of erythema or fever um, because that's not a mastitis, that's just breast engorgement versus a mastitis, which causes erythema and fever. Uh, management here for engorgement would just be to lactation suppression if the breastfeeding is stopped and it's accomplished as follows so they would have to wear comfortable supportive bras that are because tight bras can cause inadvertent nipple stimulation <clears throat> uh, when you have you want to avoid all types of nipple stimulation and manipulation because in that case you'd want to your body would want to produce more breast milk due to the um constant oxytocin release by the pituitary you want to apply the ice packs to the breast and NSAIDs to decrease inflammation and pain. Also, breast binders are not recommended because they increase the risk of mastitis and plug ducts and they increase pain. So why? Uh, so no breast binders. If you see breast binders on a vignette, that's not the right answer. Medications are not are also not recommended. Engorgement itself basically leads to events that cause cessation of lactation due to negative inhibition of prolactin release. Uh, management, if breastfeeding is to be continued, would be to use cool compressants, to use NSAIDs and acetaminophen, and that's used for symptom control. And patients should feel an improvement in symptoms as regular feedings or pumping is established. Um, lacto, I'm sorry, lactational mastitis. Um, 
the pathogenesis of lactational mastitis would be skin flora like Staph auris entering the duct through nipples and, multi and then it multiplies in the stagnant milk. Risk factors would be a past history of mastitis, engorgement and inadequate milk drainage due to a sudden increase in sleep duration, replacing nursing, replacing nursing with formula or pumped breast milk can cause mastitis, weaning, pressure on the duct like a tight bra or clothing or sleeping in the prone position, um, cracked or clogged nipple pores and a poor latch. Um, clinical presentations would be like fever, firm, red, and tender, swollen, qua uh, swollen quadrant of the unilateral breast, with or without myalgias, with or without chills or malaise. And treatment would be just to give them analgesics, frequent breastfeeding and pumping, as well as antibiotics. Now, bacteria is also transmitted by infants nasopharynx so direct feeding with both breasts is the best way to completely drain milk ducts so you want to encourage to nurse an infant every two to three hours it is safe for the infant to consume milk as they are already colonized by bacteria um, now there's a pediatrics question that's similar to this <clears throat> that says <clears throat> what would you do in a patient who's complaining about um, breastfeeding that she doesn't feed her she she says she doesn't think anything's wrong because she feeds her baby every four to six hours um, well that's actually um, that's actually an insufficient amount of time for feeding you have to actually feed for um, <clears throat> more often than four to six hours you have to feed every two to three hours um, so it can, in pediatrics, it can lead to breastfeeding failure, jaundice, when we get to that in pediatrics. Um, so yeah, so you want to feed with both breasts every two to three hours. So preferred empiric therapy here would be methicillin sensitive staph aureus, like decloxacillin or cephalexin. And if MRSA is involved or there's MRSA risk factors, uh, like a recent antibiotic therapy, residence in a long-term care facility, or incarceration, then clindamycin, timrethoprim with sulfamethoxazole, or vancomycin can be given. Um, finally, uh, breast abscesses are untreated, or severe mastitis can lead to a formation of an abscess. Clinical features of an abscess would be a mastitis that has a fluctuant tender palpable mass, Diagnosis is made clinically. Ultrasound may be required to differentiate a mastitis from an abscess if it's a mass that's deep within the tissue. Uh, treatment would be to needle aspirate the breast abscess under ultrasound guidance and to give them antibiotics like decloxacillin or cephalexin for a surrounding mastitis. First line treatment would be, uh, and that's first line treatment. And then you want to also tell them to continue breastfeeding. An abscess is not responsive to needle aspiration and antibiotics. You want to suspect necrotic material and a large, more than five centimeter pulse co uh, pus collection. Then you want to incision and drainage that with a surgical drainage and packing. That's recommended. So if it doesn't respond with um, needle aspiration, then you have to go into the OR and surgically drain it. Um, Surgical drainage may be required if the overlying skin is thin with imminent abscesses at, with an imminent abscess rupture. All right, so we have reached the end of gynecology, and that was a long one. Um, so I'm going to just point out some pointers here at the end of this chapter. So pelvic inflammatory disease is uncommon after the first trimester and cervical mucus and decidua seals off and protects the uterus from pathogens like chlamydia and gonorrhea during pregnancy. Um, next pointer is that any systemic infection can trigger preterm labor, even if it doesn't originate from the reproductive tract. Um, another pointer is that lead exposure occurs in patients living in homes built before the 1960s I would say even um, in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, but yeah, uh, before 1960s is good. 
Um, next pointer is calcium gluconate is used as an antidote to magnesium toxicity. Um, a lower next pointer is that lower back pain in the third trimester of pregnancy is very common, and that's due to an increase in lumbar lordosis and relaxation of the ligaments that support the sacroiliac joints of the pelvic girdle due to hormonal factors, and that leads to a dull pain with an increased uh, intensity of at the end of the day. Also, alkaline phosphatase is normally increased during pregnancy, so that's a good pointer. Um, the next pointer would be alkaline phosphatase. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that one already. Uh, ult an ultrasound showing thin endometrial stripe is going to be normal, and that represents an empty uterus with no retained products of conception. So if they they always like to uh, say uh, um, talk about that endometrial st stripe on vignettes, so. Uh, if you see an ultrasound that shows a thin endometrial stripe, that's normal. And what that means is that there's an empty uterus with no retained products of conception. Uh, the next pointer is that labor should be allowed to proceed in patients where the fetus has been diagnosed with a severe congenital abnormality that's incompatible with life. Um, C and the next pointer, C-section or cesarean delivery after a maternal trauma is gonna be indicated for fetal rescue in the cases of an imminent maternal death to assist with maternal cardiopulmonary resuscitation due to a category three tracing. Uh, next pointer is that fibroids are commonly, fibroids commonly degenerate during pregnancy when they outgrow their blood supply. Um, so they'll have intense constant abdominal pain without any bleeding. That's a fibroid. And finally, terbutaline, that's a tocolytic, is given if there is a uterine contraction abnormality, like a tachycystole of more than five contractions in 10 minutes, or tetanic contractions that last more than two minutes that cause fetal heart rate abnormalities. And that is the end.